has the responsibility to protect its people. The Law Society of Kenya has been directed to convene within 21 days, failure to which the court ruled that the chair's caucus shall take over the functions of the council. The Law Society of Kenya President Nelson Harvey was dealt a major blow after the High Court nullified the suspension of CEO Masiwa Mbua and council members in a judgment delivered by Justice Anthony Mrima. The court ruled that resolutions passed that led to the expulsion of the members were null and void since the special general meeting was not properly convened. Justice Mrima ruled that Ms. Sombua was legally in office, whereas a caretaker council appointed was an illegal entity. He has also held that President Nelson Harvey is the spokesperson of LSK. Harvey, who is eyeing a political seat ahead of the 2022 general elections, was elected LSK boss in February 2020 after trouncing Charles Kanjama, Haria Chagai, and Haria Mbeneka. He recently hinted at resigning, stating that the September 24th special meeting was his last assignment as president. You're being advised to use water sparingly between today and tomorrow as Nairobi City Water and Sewerage Company will be suspending water supply to allow for repair works at the Ngethu Water Treatment Plant areas in city centre. You are in main campus, Coca-Cola Factory, JKIA, EPZ Ati River and Mnolongo will be affected including several estates in the city. The shutdown will facilitate interconnection of new Kiambu Embakasi pipeline to the Ngethu Gigiri transmission pipeline at the Kiambu Reservoir in readiness to transfer water to Embakasi. Mihango, Utawala and Dry areas once the Northern Collective Water Project is completed in June 2022. Former Laikipia North MP Matthew Lempurkel has been released on 100,000 shillings cash bail pending the determination of his appeal. The former MP was sentenced to one year in prison on November 5th for assaulting current Laikipia North MP Sara Korere at Arambe House in Nairobi on November 21st, 2016. He went to court on November 25th to challenge his sentence. Saitabao Kanchori Lempurkel's lawyer argued that the court erred in punishing Lempurkel because evidence shows that Korere was the aggressor in the altercation. Now, a section of UDA allied leaders are crying foul over today's special sitting of the National Assembly that is expected to consider a bill to amend the Political Parties Act and provide for new ways of coalition building. Gerita Town MP Eden Duale says he will be seeking amendments to remove some of the provisions in the bill, failure to which he will proceed to court to challenge the amendments. As Parliament heads a call, heads a call to a special sitting today and tomorrow, six items are on the agenda. The most controversial legislative agenda being proposed amendments to the Political Parties Act. In the bill, the definition of a political party will be changed to include a coalition political party with member parties qualified to an allocation of the political parties fund. Now, a Form 3 student from Tahara Secondary School in Maragua constituency in Muranga County was allegedly murdered by a border border rider yesterday. The suspect who appears who operates in Karaha area is said to have lured the girl with a Christmas present and invited her to his home before killing her. It is reported that the rider had promised to buy her clothes for the festivities if she visited him at his home. The girl's body was moved to Muranga Hospital Mortuary as investigations into the matter continue. Meanwhile, the suspect has since been arrested and is being detained at Muranga Police Station pending arraignment. And rescue operations at the building that collapsed last Friday in Gatanga, Muranga County have been called off. This is after two men who were feared trapped in the rubble of the collapsed building appeared at the scene. This is Newswire, Dennis Aceto. The Spice FM Newswire is brought to you by InDriver. Download the InDriver app from the App Store or Google Play Store to enjoy a safe, comfortable, and affordable ride around Nairobi. There are so many people peddling what is false and that it bears remarkable resemblance to what is true. Politicians have their agenda and their agenda is to use every opportunity to sell that agenda and to loot this nation. I have seen major strides that are done 
in this country when we talk to each other as against talking at each other. We start getting back into the tribal cocoons which were put to us by the colonial powers. You know, they gave us physical freedom but not mental freedom. We're still mentally colonized today into these cocoons of tribe. Now, if you live in an area where it's difficult to find a dog, <laughs> he's a goat. I kid you not. In which part of this country is it difficult <laughs> to find a dog? Such Spice FM Nieri You're going to find a little bit of it this Tuesday morning on Mombasa Road. We've had an accident there this morning and things are not looking good at all. On the um, expressway right around Imaradaima is where you have a little bit of a hold up. And that is having traffic tail back all the way to Cabanas um, this morning. So that's something to watch out for heading in that direction. It's going to slow you down just a little bit. What else are we looking at? Um... On the Fika Superhighway, traffic not really. It's a wet morning. It's raining heavily in some parts. Jogo Road is already starting to pile up. Langash Road not looking too bad this morning. Fika Superhighway, no traffic at all. It's just waking up and hopefully we can keep it just so. Traffic levels reducing this week. Let's have a look at what it will look like in a short while. But it seems like we're starting off all right, except for those few accidents here and there. Let's be careful. The roads are slippery more than usual. Spice of MKE on Twitter, that's how you can get in touch this morning. Text on 40127. Broadcasting worldwide, Spice FM. This is The Situation Room, the home of hard-hitting political commentary and penetrating insights about the state of the nation. This is a talk radio experience like no other. The Situation Room, a place for hard truths, debates, and elevated conversations. The Situation Room, witty, political, engaging, deep, controversial. In the room, we have C.T. Muga, researcher, academic, seasoned political observer, a fountain of wisdom in these politically uncertain times. Ndu Oko, Nigerian by birth, Kenyan by choice, communications expert, pan-Africanist, a truth seeker and believer in people power, and Eric Latin. Agent provocateur, the man in the chair, seasoned journalist, news hound, a man who believes in punching up, not down. This is the Situation uh, Room. Good morning. Welcome to Kenya's biggest conversation, the Situation Room, wherever you're locked in this morning. It's a fine Tuesday morning. And the date is the 21st of December and the year is still 2021. In just a couple of days time. We'll be saying Happy New Year to mm. 2022. Ndu. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm fine, thank you. Uh -huh. Yes. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Mm. Mm. Did you sleep well? I did. That's good. Mm. The weather is raining. The, ra the weather is really raining. Mm. Mm. How are you, City? I'm fine, thank you. Mm. Yes. Weather notwithstanding. Sorry. Yeah. Cold weather notwithstanding. Not no, sorry, sorry. Very cold weather notwithstanding. <laughs> Winter notwithstanding. Is it winter, really? Man. Sheesh. It's cold. It's actually the eighth day of Christmas. Yeah, but also, mm. uh, that lake that we have on Uhuru Highway. Mm. Uhuru, Lake Uhuru. Yeah, Lake Uhuru mm. is back in full swing. It is. And it even has distributaries. Oh, yeah. You know, it's uh, six days since uh, Kenha opened that those sections that they were supposed to open. Ndu tells me they opened two sections. Mm. They've opened everywhere, but now what is, what is leave Ndu alone? Leave Ndu alone? Mm. They've opened everywhere. Yeah, yeah. If you find anything to the contrary, that's you. I am the one who has diverted wrongly. Yes. But then they've opened it. They right? opened that a long time ago. On the 15th of December, they were supposed to open a section at, uh, was it Gateway Mall? And they opened. And it was open. The section between Haile Selassie Avenue and uh, uh, Museum Hill Interchange is open. If you find yourself driving in the puddles of mud, that's your problem. That's you. Actually, it isn't puddles of mud. It's puddles of water in the middle of the road. Yeah, uh, completely. Yes, road, road, as in where there's stomach road. Mm. Yes. And there's a diversion now. Okay, well. Heading, the road is uh, there, the tarmac is there, the water is also the there. The water is also there. Everything is there. Everything is there, yes. Mm. And that water isn't moving, meaning it's not being drained. Yes. Yes. 
You know, I follow that route every day. So I know when it expands and when it increases. Mm. Yes. You can basically tell its story, its life history. Just like I can tell the life history of the expressway. Mm. I can tell you the life history at night, early in the morning, in the daytime, middle of the day, I can tell you. Uh -huh. Yes. So when someone tells you that it will be complete early next year, mm. <laughs> <laughs> you need to tell that person to write a book on fables. <laughs> Clearly, that person is a storyteller. It's a lies. <laughs> Ndu, what yeah. day of Christmas is it? Again? Eight. What, what happens on the eighth day? Many things happen on the eighth day. However, on the eighth day of Christmas, my true love gave to me eight maids are milking, seven swans are swimming, six geese are laying, five golden rings, four calling birds, three French hens, two turtle doves, and a partridge in a pear tree. What are those now? Eight maids are milking. What does that mean? Senator Sylvia Kasanga knows. Eight maids are milking. Maids, maids, milking cows. Okay. That is a real roundabout way of advertising milk, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. But yeah. you use maidens for, to sell cars and to sell tires. Yeah. Why can't you use them to sell milk? Mm -hmm. Completely. Mm -hmm. Okay, welcome to the show, everybody. We'll have uh, several conversations today. Let's start with the COVID in numbers. Yes, let's look at what's going on with COVID. Let's look at world numbers now. Uh, 275 million is where we are. Um, <laughs> I've been there for... Uh, a couple of hours. We are looking at partial lockdowns. Schools have closed abruptly in the United States. Uh, these are messages that were then sent across the continental U.S. Um, to have school close early. Um, they should have been closing in about a week or uh, from now. Uh, but there's been the message across the Education Direction Board to say, you know what, we're seeing rising cases of COVID, let's close. Partial lockdown states and cities are crying, saying another Christmas indoors. They will not be handled, they'll be able to handle this very well. Mm -hmm. uh, those are the announcements that came um, out of the US yesterday. And quite a number of people are lamenting uh, over that. Um, if we just look at the US numbers, for example, they're now at... Uh, 52,059,667 cases uh, globally. Uh, inching closer and closer to a million deaths, unfortunately. Those numbers don't look pretty good. Uh, but they've been able to keep things under wraps for... Well, not under wraps, but they've been able to keep things under control uh, for quite some time. But now those numbers are not looking really pretty. Let's look at what's happening in the country right now. We still have those 23 million um, dose, uh, vaccines as the total number of vaccines that have come into the country. Um, between yesterday and now, about 100,000 vaccinations have been done because we're now at 8.9 million. So 8,902,539 vaccines have been administered. That is 13.2% um, of uh, adults completely uh, uh, fully vaccinated. All right. Yesterday, 1,020 new cases of COVID from a sample size of 3,444. It increases Kenya's positivity rate by 5 percentile points. That is now at 29.6%. Yesterday, we were at 24.4. Now that has risen some. And there is um, the worry lines in uh, certain sections are getting deeper and deeper. No deaths having been recorded over the last 30 days. Um, total confirmed positive cases in the country now stand at 264,727. Um, are people still going to travel for the holidays? Indeed. Are things going to uh, continue in terms of children coming home from school and mm. then traveling back in a couple of days? That will be the case. Are there interventions that can be made to protect the population? Yes, they can. There are. Will they do it? That is left. We see. Do the people want to be to see any measures, any new measures, or old measures reinstituted? You know, uh, this conversation has to be broken down. The only protection that we know of as of now against COVID is a vaccination. Uh, it isn't a lockdown. It isn't a curfew. Uh, it is a vaccination. Uh, so. Why are we having conversations about things that do not guarantee you the maximum protection that you're talking about? And why are we talking about 
instituting pro processes that are going to be abrogated. For sure. You know, this, the power of a narrative is something that has caught my attention in the recent past. Mm. Western media decided that Omicron was an African thing. Uh, okay? Uh, and I listen to the news every single day. I listen to BBC every day. And you know that, what I find amazing? Mm. My friend, that variant is spreading in Europe like wildfire. So I'm thinking, so are you telling me that South Africans moved in large numbers to Europe, to Europe. And, and to America to spread this thing? Yeah. You know that same old story of where COVID originated? Yeah. It reignited my mind. The first route at China. And yet, research was indicating that there were strains of the virus that were being found in Europe, more so in North America, mm -hmm. that were extremely similar to the COVID one. Yes. And that it had been there some years prior to this COVID uh, scare and, and the magnitude came into being. Yeah. That conversation comes up. You know, it rears its head, dies. dies. Then it dies. We go back to origin. Yes. It's 17 minutes after 6. Let's take a quick break. Are you online? Because we are live streaming the show on Spice of MKE, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. If you say hello, we will appreciate it and say hello back at you. Good morning. This is the Situation Room, the only way to start your day. Spice up your life. 24-7, around the world, non-stop. This is Spice FM. Guys, dinner is ready. Please pass the chicken. Wow, mom, the chicken looks yummy. Can't wait to dig in. Without a doubt, Ken Chick Chicken is usually the star attraction on dinner tables across Kenya because we place the highest priority on the health of the chicken we farm and the goodness of the food we provide. This is strengthened by our absolute certainty of traceability from our farm to your family. Ken Chick, we are cuckoo about tasty chicken. Hello. Hello. Umesikia? Uh, nimesikia nini? Ujasikia habari? Hebu <laughs> acha nikuambie. Kile kimetokea. Hello? 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 Don't wait for hearsay. Dial star 550 star 1 hash to read the standard e-paper from the convenience of your mobile phone for only 20 shillings from your telecom line. And stay up to date for a reliable source with over 100 years of experience. With it no continues to rain in Nairobi at 17. We'll see highs of 22 and lows of 16 today. 14 degrees and cloudy conditions in Nakuru. Highs of 24 and lows of 14. Nyeri is raining as well at 15. Highs of 20 and lows of 15 today. It's 13 degrees, quite cool in Elder at highs of 24. And in Mombasa, it's raining at 25, highs of 30 and lows of 24. Sunny conditions will herald the morning in Malindi at 26, highs of 30 and lows of 25. It's mostly cloudy in Kisumu at 21, highs of 29 and lows of 19. And we're looking at cloudy conditions at 19 in Kakamega, highs of 30 and lows of 17. It's raining in Kampala at 21, highs of 26 and lows of 19, while rain also in Dar es Salaam this morning at 26, highs of 31 and lows of 25. Johannesburg is clear at 14, highs of 22. And there's still a haze over the city, the Hamatan kicking right into Lagos, highs of 34 and lows of 23. 25 and partly cloudy conditions in Kinshasa, highs of 32 and lows of 24. Looking into Beijing, it's 6 degrees and sunny into early afternoon Tuesday. Highs of 7 and lows of minus 2. Paris at 1 degree is clear, going beyond freezing at a negative minus, at, at, sorry, at minus 2. Highs of 4. 5 degrees and cloudy in London. Highs of 7 today. And New York still, Monday night, is clear at 3. Coming into Tuesday, likely to see highs of 4 and lows of 1. Spice up your life. Mature, intelligent talk every morning. Spice up yourself. All right, 21 minutes after six. Who's online? Daniel says good morning from Subukia and in Riyadh. That's where Evelyn Kavaya is and says good morning. Good to be on board. 
uh, this morning. Yes, indeed, it is. Robert Mbogo says, tuned in from a rainy Mombasa. We greet you from a rainy Nairobi. Bishagora Omukara says, tuned in from Gitari Village. Hello, good people. Well, hello, good person. Good morning to the trio and all the listeners of TSR from the Great Wall of Kino. Good morning, Junior. How are you? And good morning also from Victor. Omondi Mwalimu says he's tuning from Langata this morning and tuning from Doha. That's where Chumba is listening this morning. Mary Kibe says, good morning. And we can see all of you waking up. Asante sana for joining us. Karibu. Karibu ni sana, everybody. City, the day is proverb. <sighs> you know, <laughs> what is it now? Sometimes one gets a little spoiled for choice and one wonders. One? No, I, I am that one. Who yeah. And let me explain to you what I wonder. Mm. Right? I'm looking at the list of proverbs that I had prepared for today. Mm. And I'm asking myself, surely. Some of these proverbs, do I really get to the heart of the meaning? Uh, let, let me explain to you what I mean by that. Eh? Or do I get to the heart of the import? Today's proverb was, Chanda, Choma, Huvikwa, Pet. Chema. What did I say, Choma? Yeah. Uh, Chema. Mm. Yes. Chanda Chema, who we call Pete. Translated, a handsome finger gets the ring. Mm. Or a nice finger gets the ring. Mm. Now, I was thinking about the meaning, and not so the meaning, but the import of it. Eh? Mm. Is it, does one choose the meaning of one deserves, one gets what they deserve, or good fortune favors a prepared mind? Mm. or good things come to those who wait. But you tell us ever so often, CT, that it's about the interpretation. It is, but on a cold morning... Or... Influencing factors, Yeah, right? my thinking is not quite what it usually is on warm days. On warm days. No, eh? it isn't. Mm. I tend to Chanda ponder... Chema Yes, I, 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 I tend to ponder over simple things a lot more than I ordinarily do. Mm. Hmm? It's a good one. We'll always get the praise. Let me explain to you why I'm saying this. Mm. Yeah, I had another one which I'd also planned. Mkia wanyani, how bandu kinyani. Mkia wanyani, how bandu kinyani. Yes. Uh huh. A monkey's tail oh. will never leave it. Okay. Will never leave the monkey. Didn't know that one. A monkey will always walk with its tail. Mm, never leave its tail behind. It'll never leave its tail behind. Mm. Okay. So this is the conclusion I came to. Uh. Where is it written that I must only mention one proverb? Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> this is where we're going with this. Mm. <laughs> Take your pick. There are two proverbs for the day. Chanda chema hovi kopete. Kiwanyani, how about kinyani? Yes. All right. <laughs> All righty. Good guy. Okay. Let's take a look at the headlines. In the papers today, you can get the Standard E paper for only 20 shillings if you just go to www.standardmedia.co.ke. Subscribe and you will get access to good paper content. Plus, you have access as well, as well to the Standard Media archives and... You have access to free Sudoku and free crossword puzzle. The headlines, the papers, it's about what's happening in Parliament this morning. That's the headline in the nation. The standard, do you have the star with you, City? No. You know where the problem your, was, Oh, it was raining. My person. Yeah, it was raining, so your person... My person... Was not at his usual no, location. No, he's not there. I passed by yesterday, same story, wasn't there, so... Ah. Mm. So there's a bill that's uh, going to Parliament this morning, and this is being sponsored by... National Assembly Majority Leader, Amos Kimunya, who is taking a, a political party's amendment bill to parliament. Now, it has issues. And these issues are um, what the proposal is. It's that the proposal is to form a grand coalition, a giant coalition, that then recognizes the coalition as a coalition itself, and allows smaller parties to fill candidates wherever, but 
when it comes to political party uh, funds sharing, they will be able to share under that. And also, the presidential candidate can actually vie for presidency under the coalition itself and not under a political, the political party. Yeah. Or the drama. So, for example, Raila Odinga vies for presidency under Azimio La Umoja and not necessarily under ODM. So he becomes an Azimio La Umoja candidate, mm -hmm. not an ODM candidate. Cute. Then it brings in all these other polit smaller political parties into the fold, and the pol political parties don't have to fold to join the coalition. They can still remain as their political parties, but they'll be recognized as a coalition. They'll be recognized as um, Azimio Let's. As, as mulets. Mm. Today, debate opens in the National Assembly on a bill that seeks to allow formation of a coalition party thought to be the Azimiola Umoja on whose ticket Odinga is expected to vie for the presidency. But allies of the Deputy President William Ruto have proposed further changes to the bill intended to scuttle efforts to legislate a coalition party and also shield them from sanctions for campaigning for UDA, which the DP plans to use. The contest will be central certainly uh, be decided through a vote will once again settle the long-running controversy which of the two political factions has the numbers in parliament yesterday house leaders allied to the president dared their rivals to demonstrate their numerical strength given the dp has often claimed his side as 130 mps however the last time the factions faced off in the house the dp side was unable to block a bill to amend the constitution and the bbi campaign fronted by the president and mr odinga unlike the constitutional amendment bill that required a two-thirds threshold to pass the house on to pass this time the house only needs 50 mps as a quorum to consider the bill <laughs> eh. Yep. So it's a battle now between the uh, UDA people, allied, coming to try and scuttle this bill. Because if this bill passes, then it goes to, to the Senate, then it goes to the President, then the President ascends to it before February, it's applicable in the next election. If you delay and we don't have the bill assented to by the President by February, then it does not apply in this election. And to worry, it will apply. Even if it's not a sentence. It will apply. The, the, by the time this thing is coming to the public domain and we're even discussing it, everything has been set. Not forget, we were thinking it's been set in motion. No. Uh. The pillars are in place. Uh. Uh, they're just rolling it. Yeah, that's it's the arrogance that done. we've seen before. And where is the BBI right now? Mm -hmm. Nowhere. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing that's being planned. You can Absolutely. scuttle it, scuttle it, scuttle it, and even go to court and scuttle it. Mm. It's about the February dead, deadline. Mm. So it can still be taken to court. And if the court says, ah, no, 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 this one um, goes against a certain aspect of the Constitution, then You know, scuttled. even that BBI story, yeah. it hasn't ended. It's like the ICC cases. It hasn't ended. Of course it hasn't. It just wasn't going to be used in these campaigns. No, it just wasn't going to be used in the format that they, it was first brought to the public in. Mm -hmm. Yes. But about it coming in piecemeal, coming in through other... Oh, mm, no. It'll find no, its way. No, no. It's, some of these things are like a hydra. Mm -hmm. Okay? You think it's only one head because that's what's visible, but it has many, many other heads. Mm -hmm. And you chop off one, three other heads grow in its And place. tentacles to boot. Yes. So... Mm. You know, the one wonders sometimes huh, when you look at these political maneuverings mm -hmm. and the intended, the supposed intended goodness that is supposed, public good is supposed to bring about, yeah. you have to question it. Because how often are political machinations purposely intended to benefit people? Mm -hmm. No, it's, it's intended to benefit, benefit the politics of the time and the people who are pushing that particular agenda. That really is the, is, 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 is the thrust of it. And if there are any benefits to the citizenry, it's a byproduct. Mm -hmm. And often it's not even the central product that was purposed. No. Mm, it's something happened. else. It, it, it comes on its way. Mm. But on a positive note. Let's take a break. <laughs> See, we've taken a note. Uh, we've taken a positive <laughs> note. <laughs> Very positive note. <laughs> Half past six, Kenya's biggest conversation. It continues. Let's take a look at what's happening on the roads and then we look at other headlines. Good morning. This is the Situation Room. The only way to start your day. Spice up your life.
24-7, around the world, non-stop. This is Spice FM. Bro, what? Na si watu wamejenga manyumba yeria. Kwanza angalia ile. Are you seeing that roof, that color? Sio ni nyumba mpya. That's not a new house, bro. That's a cover max roof. Cover max? Cover max. It's more than just a roof. It's color that lasts. Ukiweka, umeweka. So whose new house is that anyway? Really nice. <laughs> Niangu, how is that possible? Good choice from me. Cover max didn't let me down. It's good to have a long lasting roof when you have a family, you know. Cover max roofing sheets with advanced color coating technology. A quality product from Mabati Rolling Mills. This is something people need to understand. Your money, my money, equals our money. We cannot have your money is our money mm. and my money is my, my money. money. The only way to live your best life is to create a balance between work, love and play. The Adults in the Room is the only show on radio dedicated to educating Kenyans on how they can stay winning in life and in love. Text the word ADULT to 22840 to get the latest clips from Adults in the Room directly to your mobile phone. SMS ADULTS to 22840. So that backed up traffic on Mombasa Road this morning it does not look pretty at all. It's as a result of an accident that took place just before the Maradaima turnoff. And uh, now that's traffic that's stretching all the way past General Motors, guys. And then uh, in the other direction, way beyond Cabanas. And it looks like until that trailer is removed from that section of the road, it's going to take a while. So if you've not left yet, that's what lies ahead. But all we're seeing is red bumper to bumper action on Mombasa Road this morning. Uh, after General Motors, you're fine, however, and other parts of the city have not even started to clog up. Langata Road looking pretty good. Jogo Road also piling just after the train station. And then we're looking at Landis Road also with some traffic going towards Haile Selassie Avenue. The CBD is taking the biggest hit right now. Most of our other roads in Nairobi, not much of an issue coming off of the Thika Superhighway, then towards Pangani is where you'll see some action. But beyond that, it doesn't look bad at all. Coming out of Westerns onto Waiaki Way, just a little bit of traffic here and there. Use the Red Hill Link Road if you need to get away from any drama whatsoever. Otherwise, you should be alright sticking on Waiaki Way, actually. Uh, shall we look at what it looks like in a short while? Help us out here if you see any issues uh, where you are. Spice FMKE on Twitter, text 401 www.showmax.com That's www.showmax.com Say again. Showmax.com or www.showmax.com HTTPS ah, HTTP <laughs> Backslash, backslash Semicolon Okay this is uh, where you actually go and get information about Showmax and the packages that are available. You can get Showmax, Showmax uh, uh, Mobile, Showmax Pro, Showmax Pro Mobile. And once you subscribe, you get access to all this wonderful content. This is on a daily basis, all right? Wherever you are, you just get access to it. All you need is some internet connectivity. And you can even choose the speed of your internet connection. That means how much internet you're consuming as you watch your content mm. the most fantastic gift to get during this christmas festive season this is the one showmax.com it's 25 minutes to seven spice fm malindi mature intelligent talk every morning spice up yourself Mornings done right. 24 25 to 7 CT on a more positive note. Yes. You know, for all these politicians who make their debut in college mm. and are political leaders, we've had quite a few of them in this country. Yeah. The late Dr. Uki Mbaka was one such person. Living alive and well and kicking. One Mr. James Orengo. Mwishimiwa James Orengo, yeah. student leader. Chile is now having their turn. Mm. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. 35 year old yep. Gabriel Boric uh -huh. former student leader uh -huh. now president of Chile uh -huh. mm -hmm. mm. full Youth. president so all this discussion we've had in this country about the youth leading 
well, why don't you just conduct a brief study, uh, even as you cyber warrior, on what it is that the youth of Chile did uh, to be able to elect this new president mm. into office. What was it that uh, this win signifies? It signified that uh, they hadn't forgiven the dictatorship of Pinochet. Mm. The ravages of that dictatorship and the suffering that people went through because the person who was competing against Boric mm. was a sympathizer and an apologist for the Pinochet, Pinochet rule. Yes. yes, indeed. And so when Pinochet's widow, who had been alive all this time, passed away, mm. as uh, some humorous commentator said, the unfortunate thing was this particular candidate had now lost one vote. Mm. Okay. Mm. <laughs> but uh, clearly, the people of Chile, much as there were people who supported that old regime, the vast majority did not think so. Remember, they went on to a runoff. Eh? Mm -hmm. Election number one, no clear winner. They said, okay, now that's the two of you mm. compete. Go. And a clear winner emerged. Yeah. And graciously, Boric's competitor conceded defeat and said yes. Early enough. It is good. Yeah. It is good. Oh, yes. You're that also it may not necessarily mean that they have people have forgotten. No. It just means that um, there are other factors, which is quite interesting because if somebody who comes in and says, you know, they, they speak glowingly about the Pinochet years, um, the dictatorship of Pinochet. Also, I saw somewhere in the co some commentaries that, okay, during the Pinochet years and then soon after, that's when uh, Chile was among the most stable economies in Latin America. In fact, it was the most stable economy in, in, Lat in Latin America. It was stable. During Pinochet and soon after Pinochet. At what cost? So people maybe have looked at it and thought, okay, well, yeah, but um, what, he's, what he's campaigning under is not the killing of people. No. It is the other side of the Pinochet years. You know, if you look at any government in the world and you look at even what we now call contemporary dictators, mm. like the president of Hungary, mm. you're looking at... you. you Ukraine, mm. okay? The truth of the matter is that every regime has its supporters. Yep. Because every regime, no matter how brutal you may think it is, there are people who actually benefit from it. Yep. And the numbers are not few. Yep. And that's why they're able to stay in power for as long as they do. Mm. You must have some form of support for you to stay in power. Now, even when that person is no longer there, there are people who look back and say, you know, when so-and-so was president, yeah, I know there are uh, terrible things that happened. But I benefited. There was this and the other. Yes, I saw change. Mm. Some of us also, let's not forget the influence of the Western media on branding regimes and calling this one is a dictatorial authoritarian regime and another one is a very good regime. Actually, oddly enough, someone like Pinochet was actually supported by the West. Mm -hmm. uh, it, 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 it was, it was a, a trademark of the West. Uh, forget West. America at that particular point in yeah, time. Yeah. You talk about Batista in an earlier time in Cuba. Mm. You just cut across. Mm. All the presidents of that particular era were dictators and they were horrible people who did horrible and unspeakable things to their people. Mm. And that's why the leftist leaning groups would come in. You look at Nicaragua. All, you look at the Sandinistas. All these groups that came into power came into power because the people who had been there had actually butchered their people and treated them really badly. Mm. But with the support of America and the West. Yeah. Indeed. Yes. So, again, the narrative of the West was to paint anything that seemed socialist as the worst possible thing next to being the devil itself. Yep. Unfortunately, the people in those countries didn't quite agree with them. <laughs> True. So, let us watch this because this is going to be a case to study. But again, remember, France experimented with this earlier. Because their president is also youth. Mm. Mm. So, are we saying that we have entered the era of the youth? We have young leaders all left, right, and center across the globe. Look at if you look at Finland, country. yes, Finland has a young prime minister. Uh, New Zealand, and their ladies. Yep. Mm. So even North Korea, yes, has a young leader. So, Kenyans, <laughs> you can also be a leader. And young at the same time. Yes. Right. Nothing's stopping you. Indeed. Uh -huh. So there was a ship that docked in Mombasa. Remember that? Yes. Yesterday. Now, 
The ship carrying radioactive cargo has forced to return to Port of Origin in India. The vessel carrying a container with radioactive material destined for Tanzania was ordered to return to the port of loading in India with its contents on Sunday morning. So that's in a few days from now. According to the Kenya Ports Authority, MV Sigo Pereres, which docked at the Mombasa port from a Salara port in Oman, had 4196 containers. But after scanning a 20-foot container with identification number TCKU3337296, showed high levels of radiation, forcing the port officials to isolate it. KPA head of container operations Simon Wahome yesterday said the, ar the vessel arrived at the port on the 13th of December. The container was loaded in India by a trader under a company named Shipper Prama Exports Limited based at Maharashtra Estate, uh, sorry, State and was declared as a gas mantle, salty padlocks and assorted hardware goods. So after all of this suspecting and asking questions of what must we do, he said that uh, it was meant to be received in Hadifa Ali Hamad in Zanzibar. The container was reloaded on the 14th after scanning and taking measures to protect the crew. He said the port acted according to the International Maritime Organization laws, which call for such vessel, vessels and their cargo to be sent back to the loading port by releasing it to sail. Um, back to India after meeting all Ministry of Health conditions on Sunday. So what is essentially going to happen, or rather, uh, was that uh, they've received all the documentation mm -hmm. and the MV Sigo Piraeus will be on its way. So they've sent it back? Yes. Return to sender. Back. Thank you very much. It's going back. Okay. <coughs> now, remember the NHIF Amendment Bill? That was in the National Assembly. It passed the National Assembly. It went to the Senate. Mm. It has uh, faced some hurdles in the Senate. Senators have rejected some provisions of the bill passed by their counterparts in the National Assembly, including the mandatory registration of those aged 18 years and above and punitive sanctions for fraudsters looting the state medical scheme. While the president is racing against time to provide Kenyans with affordable health care, one of the big four agenda before he leaves office in August, the decision by the Senate could delay its realization. While the National Assembly passed the bill with a mandatory registration provision, the Senate has dropped it. It has also proposed to reduce the fine and the jail term for fraudsters impersonating NHIF enrolled members from a million to 100,000 shillings. Further, the Senate is reducing the jail term for the offense from two years to six months. I wonder why they are doing this. This had been increased. Initially, the bill had 500,000 shillings as a, as a fine, but the members of the National Assembly had raised it to a million shillings, arguing that it's meant to curb rising cases of fraud at NHIF. The fraud, which is usually involves forgery of documents, has been rampant due to lack of biometrics to identify members. But NHIF is already rolling out the biometric registration of all its members. The Senate has said, no, 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 no. Bring that back to 100,000, not even uh, 500,000. Fine 100,000 shillings. Mm -hmm. And jail term, six months. Why would the Senate do this? I don't know. What do you think? It, it looks like a scuttle of the process. It's going to then, because by the time you go back and forth and agree, time is, is going. It seems like a, a deliberate scuttling of the process. But scuttling why? or is it negotiating? For them as an entity? To benefit in what manner? There must be somebody who is playing a game from outside the Senate. Who was unable to reach the members of the National Assembly, but now is being able to reach the members of the Senate. Because there's a mandatory registration of people under 18. Yes. I mean, people above 18. Mandatorily, you, you get to 18, you become a member of NHIF, you start contributing to NHIF. Yes. Then, if you are caught to have defrauded and then you're taken to court, your punishment is a million shillings or a jail term or both of up to two years. Senate is reducing that. They also um, want national and county governments exempted from penalties for failed or delayed remittance to NHIF. If the government does not remit to NHIF, the bill was proposing some penalties. 
now the senators are saying no 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 just remove the penalty but that's interesting look at what it does to them as an entity in terms of reduction of the penalties but then look at what it does to individuals who think about it at 18 years you come out maybe you don't have a source of income or you're dependent on your parents let's say they are not there mm. but then the punitive is quite extensive a million shillings or what plus or a million shillings now brought down to 100,000 now brought down to 100,000 okay so they've reduced that as well yeah hmm. but it should remain on both this is what i'm saying now if you see if you delay payment that's a different case the 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 million shilling was if you defraud any child defraud any child yes. right that's like um identity theft and yep. that's like what we are seeing currently going on yep <laughs> fine of up to a million shillings mm. But delaying, yeah, delaying of payment could this have is very many reasons by, why. You remitting delayed. by... No, no reasons. If you're an 18-year-old... No, no, no. It's remitting by county or national government. No, that, that's totally different. If a county um, or national government delays in remitting... Yes, I'm talking about the individual. Individual um, remittance. Yes, if you have if you have a delay on your remittance as an individual... There's no there penalty. Be, yeah. the, there's no jail term for that. Mm. But of course, the penalty is there, as just like every other member. If you have not, then you have to regularize. There's got to be that penalty. Like oh. currently, you pay a 50% penalty right. for every month that you've that delayed. You've delayed. Yeah. There's no reason why entities such as government should delay on these remittances. Because they've already deducted from mm, the employer. They've deducted it, so from where did the money go? Those are the games that they've been playing. If you ask that question, you're going mm. to have to ask that question of many quasi mm. government institutions and parastatals. Yes. Those what? are games that they've played yes. to keep themselves. Have you read the amounts that the universities, the national universities owe? It's billions. Well, yeah. it's, it's huge amounts. So you wonder, but these guys get money. Mm. What do they do? They By do. the way, mm. Even if the government give the money, it is deducted from the, the sal salary. Yes, so it's and deducted. They, you've been paying salary, so that means those deductions then are also. You have actually deducted. So you've deducted, you've deducted it. NHIF, you deducted NSSF, Self. you've also deducted on behalf of the circle. Yeah. Yes. And you don't remit any of those. So, what have you been doing with the money? Yeah, mm. where has it been going? You know, this one you can run around. Remember the story we had mm. of the whistleblower? Yeah. Was it not. If you look at that case, mm. this is somebody who was shining a spotlight on what these people might be doing with such funds. Yes. Remember how that person was hit? Mm. Remember that? Life mm. changed completely for him, yes. Mm. Yes. So. It's a punishing and punishing and punishing. Let's take another quick break at 11 minutes to 7. Twenty four seven around the world, non stop. This is Spice FM. Deep fried, chama, stew, breast, wings, gizzards, thighs, quarter, half, sausages. There's no greater meat than chicken. Knowing the sauce of your chicken, however, is key to truly enjoying your favorite dish. Tune into Sugar and Spice from 11 a.m. with Yolanda Mulua and DJ Absolute to learn more about how Kenchik is cuckoo about food safety, nutrition and taste from farm to family. What makes a man? I had an advertising job that was toxic. It was difficult. I'm not saying the people were toxic. I don't think anyone is inherently toxic. Don't ever let someone's perception of you become your reality. How do we navigate through career, family, and life? I was, I was an average kid. I, I, I wasn't a poor student. Examining what defines a man. We derive our identity as men based on external factors, on things that people can be able to see. A space for men to open their experiences and more. Starting Thursday, 18th November on the Standard Digital YouTube and Facebook page. Hosted by Eric Latif. Mature, intelligent talk every morning. Spice up yourself. Mornings done right. It's 9.94.4 Spice this FM, Nairobi. On here. And this is um, DCI broke a cartel and a ring of people who have been playing some games with logbooks. 
Thousands of unsuspecting Kenyans and financial institutions could be holding on to pieces of paper, thinking they are logbooks to vehicles that they own, but which have already been transferred to other people or used as collateral <laughs> for loans without their knowledge. <laughs> Investigations of a last week's arrest of suspects in a syndicate that has been changing vehicle ownership details continue to expose the rot at NTSA. Although the extent for the forgery scheme could take weeks to be fully revealed, detectives have widened their manhunt to motor vehicle dealers, Shylocks, financial institutions, and the NTSA's IT department. The DCI detectives spent the better part of yesterday questioning officials at NTSA. It is not clear whether the Director General George Njao was also questioned. The Kenya Bankers Association is expressing concern over the syndicate, warning that lenders could lose trust in vehicles as security for loans. If criminals can access the system and forge documents whose authenticity and trust depends on how safe the system is, then banks are left holding pieces of paper. This is according to KBA's Chief Executive Habilolaka. This is very interesting. On Friday, we had a conversation about using movable assets mm. in t for collateral, yep. uh, for credit. And, and encouraging, people, <laughs> encouraging people to use these movable assets as collateral. And all you needed to do was lodge it in a system. So looking at this now, mm. there's a possibility that a lot of those documents that are sitting in said system, and you go in as a lender, for example, and you see it's in the system. So you say, OK, it's, it's legit could not be legit. This actually isn't anything new. Uh. There's an angle to it that may appear to be new, uh. the digital aspect and what it is that people are doing and fiddling with it. But even before digitalization, the issue of multiple owners or multiple... Uh, um, multiple copies for one asset. Yes, of, of yeah. title deeds. Or we've lived with that for a very long time. Mm. Yes. People taking one so document of, and using not it. Not so to much on to... vehicles, though. No, 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 no. The, the vehicle issue is new. Yeah. And it's because that space has been opened. Mm. But nowadays, you go everywhere in this country, you'll find some billboards uh, uh, telling you get a logbook loan. In 24 hours. Mm. In 24 hours. Some even tell you three hours. Yep. Now, so apparently, police went to Ngara over the weekend and they recovered 450 logbooks. Say what? 450 logbooks recovered at a cyber cafe in Gara by detectives over the weekend and their indications that the syndicate has spread its tentacles far and wide. The mastermind of the syndicate working in cahoots with the officials at the country's motor vehicle registration body also illegally develops affidavits and commissions them before they are sent to contacts at NTSA for forced transfer of vehicles. To aid in the expeditious change of motor vehicle engines, the detectives established that the syndicate develops falsified importation documents from a renowned car dealer and ETR receipts, making it one of the most elaborate motor vehicles comes in recent times. A false transfer can happen in a number of reasons, including when lending institutions repossess and sell a vehicle that was used as collateral and the owner has failed to pay the loan. To do this, however, one needs to meet numerous requirements. How the syndicate was able to fraudulently transfer vehicles despite the existence of all these requirements supposed to make the process foolproof <coughs> is a question. It's ridiculous. What it tells me <laughs> is this. It's insider trading. Because to, for you to navigate those waters, you need somebody who actually understands them yep. and knows this is what is looked for, this is what is done. And it isn't one player. Remember we had this discussion some times back with reference to some of the deals that are made and how intergovernmental uh, agencies, there'll be individuals in all these agencies who play a part in it. Uh -huh. It can be Central Bank, it can be uh, KRA, it can be DCI, it, it, it can be money laundering. It, 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 but there'll be individuals who lend a hand. So it seems seamless because when somebody who works in the system and understands it gives you advice, that advice is solid. It is. They, they know exactly what to do. They get it. They know exactly who to talk to. Yep. You know, one really wishes that in this country you could read and hear of something and just take it at face value. <laughs> you can't. It's like this, what we were discussing earlier on mm -hmm. about the Senate. You can't take the goings on as just procedural. You say, no, uh -uh. no, no. Something no. Is what else? Some, yes, someone somewhere. Something Who's else playing happened. the game? Yes, exactly. Well, I know we're running out of time, but I have something to tell you. Yes. Please. So, remember how there was a case a couple of months ago, uh, or rather there was a suggestion by a high court judge saying that, you know what, if a wife 
or if a spouse stays at home taking care of the family and the other spouse is out working, it can be said that in the event of a split, you're going to share the property 50-50 because both of you have contributed to the smooth running of this home. Yes. Okay, remember that? Yes. Now, a man's bid to challenge a law barring married couples from sharing their matrimonial wealth before divorce has flopped. Family court judge Agri Mushalile dismissed a case by a man who sued his wife in a dispute over the sale of their matrimonial home in Loresha in Nairobi. The man wanted to dispose of the house worth 70 million shillings, share 60% of the proceeds with his wife and children, and use the remaining 40% to buy another home. But his wife would hear none of it, prompting the man to seek the court's intervention. From court records, the woman went ahead to place a caveat on the property to ensure her husband would not sell it. Mushelule dismissed the case by the man, codenamed MKG, for failing to adjoin Attorney General Kihara Karaoke. According to the judge, it would be unfair of the court to settle this duel between MKJ and JG and his wife, codenamed EG, without giving the AG a chance to argue on the constitutionality of Section 7 and 12 of the Matrimonial Property Act. I have ascertained that the three grounds in the objections raise pure points of law, and that if they are disposed of in the respondent's favour, they will be the end of this put, uh, petition. Lastly, there is no dispute that the facts on which the petitioner has relied on are not in dispute. You get it? So it's already in dispute. So mm. we cannot now come and say that there is none. Mm. That, that uh, the two are married and they live together in the matrimonial home. The petitioner wants to sell the house. Respondent has refused and is relying on Section 7 and 12 of the Matrimonial Property Act, which had then been amended to state that... We both came into this thing together. We own we the house will together. own it together. You cannot just go ahead and sell it, my friend. And the man is not refusing. No. He's saying, you know, I am over 70. We live here with my wife. We have adult children. The adult children are the ones who are supporting us. Mm. They have young families. Instead of burdening my children, why don't we sell this house in Loresho? We split 70% of the proceeds with my wife. We give some money to the children to support them. And then the remaining amount of money, we buy another house. Sounds reasonable, doesn't it? Mm. So that we have some income. We have some money that we can, we stop burdening, burdening our children. The wife says, uh, 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 no, 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 no. First of all, he cannot, we cannot allow this man to do that. He has a history of mismanaging family f f finances. <laughs> uh, we have other properties. We have a... Uh, piece of land in Nyeri. We have a piece of uh, some investment in Kajiado. He can go and sell any of those, but not this house. This one, Kwanza. Mm -hmm. I'm the one who looked for this house. I'm the one who identified the house. I'm the one who said we buy this house. We can't just sell it. Now the court says, the court has actually thrown out this matter on a technicality yes. because the attorney general is not involved in, in, this, in case. this case. And there are two sections of the law that they would need then the attorney general to clarify the constitutionality of... <laughs> And because then he has not been mentioned as the one who's going to clear up this matter. Yeah, case out, out first. Ah. Keep it right here for more conversations coming up in the next hour. We will be talking about the state of universal health coverage in Africa. Joining us is a senior advisor from Amref Health Africa. Very good morning. It's 7 a.m. up your life the spice fm newswire is brought to you by in driver choose your preferred driver mode of transport and negotiate your fare to your destination for a safe comfortable and affordable trip only with in driver this is newswire i'm dennis Aceto. The latest news 1, from around the world. 94.4. from a sample size of 3,444, posting a positivity rate of 29.6%. The tally of confirmed positive cases is now 264,727, while the cumulative tests so far conducted at 2,933,764. From the cases, 906 Kenyans, while 114 are foreigners, 534 females, and 486 are males, while the youngest is a one-month-old child while the oldest is 95 years. 
This is the government deadline to be vaccinated if you want to access government services lapses today. The health ministry warned that from today, anyone who has not been vaccinated will not be able to access in-person government services in what the government says is aimed at ensuring that those that have been vaccinated are protected. The court, however, made a ruling suspending the directive until when the matter is heard and determined. Health Yes Mutai Kagwe, however, said that the directive does not in any way make the vaccine uptake mandatory, but only points to the fact that the government has the responsibility to protect its citizens. Now, the Law Society of Kenya has been directed to convene within 21 days failure to which the court ruled that the chair's caucus shall take over the functions of the council. The Law Society of Kenya President Elson Harvey was dealt a major blow after the High Court nullified the suspension of the CEO Masi Wambua and council members. In a judgment delivered by Justice Anthony Mirima, the court ruled that resolutions passed that led to the expulsion of the members were null and void since the special general meeting was not properly convened. Justice Mirima ruled that Ms. Sumbua was legally in office, whereas a caretaker council appointed was an illegal entity. He has also held that President Nelson Harvey is the spokesperson of LSK. Harvey, who is eyeing a political seat ahead of the 2022 general elections, was elected LSK boss in February 2020 after trouncing Charles Kanjama, Harriet Chagai and Maria Mbeneka. He recently hinted at resigning, stating that the September 24th special meeting was his last assignment as president. Now, former Laikipia North MP Matthew Lempurkil has been released on a 100,000 shillings cash bail pending the determination of his appeal. The former MP was sentenced to money in prison on November 5th for assaulting current Laikipia North MP Sarah Korere at Harambe House in Nairobi on November 21st, 2016. He went to court on November 25th to challenge his sentence. So, Tabao Kanchori Lempurkil's lawyer argued that the court erred in punishing Lempurkel because evidence shows that Kurere was the aggressor in the altercation. Now, you're being advised to use water sparingly between today and tomorrow as Nairobi City Water and Sewerage Company will be suspending water supply to allow for repair works at the Ngethu Water Treatment Plant. Areas in City Center, UON Main Campus, Coca-Cola Factory, JKIA, EPZ, Athi River and Mlolongo will be affected, including several estates in the city. The shutdown will facilitate interconnection of new Kiambu Embakasi Pipeline to the Ngethu Gigiri Transmission Pipeline at the Kiambu Reservoir in readiness to transfer far water to Embakasi, Mihango, Utawala and Rwai areas once the Northern Collector Water Project is completed in June 2022. Now, a section of UDA allied leaders are crying foul over today's special sitting of the National Assembly that is expected to consider a bill to amend the Political Parties Act and provide for new ways of coalition building. Garissa Town MP Edin Duale says he will be seeking amendments to remove some of the provisions in the bill, failure to which he will proceed to court to challenge the amendment. As Parliament heeds a call to a special sitting today and tomorrow, six items are on the agenda. The most controversial legislative agenda being proposed amendments to the Political Parties Act. In the bill, the definition of a political party will be changed to include a coalition political party with member parties qualified to an allocation of the political party's fund. The distribution formula of the fund is proposed to be amended too. Dual has taken issue with several clauses in the bill, terming them unconstitutional and selfish. Now, a Form 3 student from Thara Secondary School in Maragua constituency, Muranga County, was allegedly murdered by a border border rider yesterday. The suspect, who operates in Karaha area, is said to have lured the girl with a Christmas present and invited her to his home before killing her. It is reported that the rider had promised to buy her clothes for the festivities if she visited him at his home. The girl's body was moved to Muranga Hospital Mortuary as investigations into the matter continue. Meanwhile, the suspect has since been arrested and is being detained at Muranga police station pending arraignment. Now, rescue operations at the building that collapsed last Friday in Gatanga, Muranga County, has been called off. These, after two men who were feared trapped in the rubble of the collapsed building, appeared at the scene. This is Newswire. I'm Dennis Aceto. The Spice FM Newswire is brought to you by InDriver. Download the InDriver app from the App Store or Google Play Store to enjoy a safe, comfortable, and affordable ride around Nairobi. Spice FM, Nakuru. 
Mombasa Road, a lot of traffic this morning. And that accident that took place very early, wee hours, uh, about four o'clock this morning, affected quite some traffic, then getting towards uh, Imaradzaima. So now we have traffic starting all the way as far back as the Waybridge today. And that has slowed things down considerably. Folks are using Southern Bypass. There's a good escape uh, from the drama that is there. So we have this bleed going all the way then towards the eastern part of the city. So Mbakasi, then going towards Altering, a little bit of traffic there, but nothing too painful as yet, which at this time is a great thing. Langatoro doesn't look too bad. Just that junction going towards the roundabout. Rilo Dinga Way is not bad at all. Free and clear all the way through to Gong Road which also not much of an issue uh, either. What else are we seeing? In the CBD, Haile Selassie Avenue is what is taking the biggest hit, as well as Jogo Road coming in before that. Thicker Superhighway, just right around Pangani is where we have some traffic today. Apart from that, things look pretty good. Let's see what it looks like in a short while. Spice FMKE on Twitter. Text 40127. Let's keep things moving. Remember, it's wet. Be careful. Roads are slippery. This is The Situation Room, the home of hard-hitting political commentary and penetrating insights about the state of the nation. This is a talk radio experience like no other. The Situation Room, a place for hard truths, debates, and elevated conversations. The Situation Room, witty, political, engaging, deep, controversial. In the room, we have C.T. Muga, researcher, academic, seasoned political observer, a fountain of wisdom in these politically uncertain times. Ndu Oko, Nigerian by birth, Kenyan by choice, communications expert, pan-Africanist, a truth seeker and believer in people power, and Eric Latif. Agent provocateur, the man in the chair, seasoned journalist, news hound, a man who believes in punching up, not down. This is The Situation Room. A very good morning to you and way. how are you doing? It's eight minutes after seven. This is Kenya's biggest conversation and now we are in the second hour of the show this lovely morning it's the 21st day of december 2021 happy tuesday wherever you're tuned in whether you are on spice fm or streaming the show online spice fm ke youtube facebook or twitter ct muga has two proverbs it's christmas after all where we're heading in that direction yeah chanda chema huvikwa pete chanda chema huvikwa pete yeah, directly translated, eh, eh. the handsome finger gets the ring. Mm -hmm. That is, of course, if you want to animate the finger and make it handsome. Mm -hmm. Then the second proverb, Mkia wa nyani, haubanduki nyani. Mkia wa nyani, haubanduki yes, nyani. nyani. Mm. In English? Well, the tail of the monkey never really leaves the monkey. Chop it off. Sea monkey, sea tail. Monkey never loses its tail. Sea tail, sea, sea monkey. monkey. Mm. Mm. Sea corruption, sea politician. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> Parliament of monkeys. <laughs> mm. you, you, you really think <laughs> that pluralism was for nothing? <laughs> 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 Let's discuss universal health coverage. And joining us in the studio this morning is Dr. Rispa Walumbe. She is a health policy advisor with AMREF Health Africa. Dr. Walumbe, good morning. Good morning. Thank good, you. Good to have you in this situation. Bro. Thank you for having me. Uh, happy holidays. Happy holidays, although it doesn't quite look quite like Christmas, like we're used to, is it? Mm. Yeah. This December is not december -ing. It's not december -ing, Like the yes. way December is usually December. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Welcome to the hot seat. We call that the hot seat. We just warm it up for our guests so that we can have a nice, comfortable conversation. And this one is about universal health coverage, which we have had a number of times, universal health coverage from this, from government, from uh, the policy, from various angles. Now, let's look at it, universal health coverage in Africa. So recently, um, there was a conference called what? The inaugural conference on public health in Africa. So this was the first of its kind. Okay. Yeah. What was that all about? 
Um, so I think uh, one of the things that uh, was going on is that uh, for a long time we had been planning to have a conference in, uh, you know, of that kind in Africa, hosted by Africa and for African public health experts, but also for government and for different actors. So um, the Conference of Public Health in Africa was really looking at the COVID-19 situation um, on the continent and trying to figure out how exactly we can kind of create our own solutions and actually scale the things that we had been discussing for a very long time over the past one and a half, more, probably two years mm -hmm. around COVID. And then, of course, aligning that with kind of like the health system challenges that have been persisting in the continent. Okay. What's the status of our health in Africa? Um, well, uh, I, I tend to be... A, quite optimistic generally. Um, but I think um, in terms of the state of, of, of health in Africa generally, um, it, each country is at different points, right? Mm -hmm. um, just because they're very unique contexts um, and generally Africa is very diverse. Um, but in terms of just, you know, putting a pulse on it or having a, like a temperature check, mm -hmm. um, I think now more than ever, there are more investments going into healthcare, mm -hmm. um, healthcare systems in Africa, just because of what we've seen um, over the past, uh, again, one and a half years. But also before that, there were already discussions around how do we make more investments in our healthcare systems so that we're able to kind of liberate ourselves from external funding and make sure that we are looking forward, looking towards the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Even as you say this, I'm just, just checking on some things here. Mm -hmm. Are we looking then, being optimistic about the state of health and then universal coverage and you know care in the con in countries on the continent? Is this government-led and government-funded, or is it government with an initiative that then brings in development partners? So when you look at the African context and even you look at the African Union, right, um, different African countries have gone through a you know, a very long history when it comes to universal health coverage. Mm. And even if you look at the evolution of healthcare policy, healthcare policy in Africa has actually been situated, first of all, by Africans as a right. Right. So this was even prior in the immediate post-colonial period. We had said that healthcare is a right for us. Right. And then, um, you know, things happened mm -hmm. <laughs> and there were external influences that kind of shifted that goalpost and made sure that we we kind of not focus too much on that. Mm. But in terms of whether this is government led, I th just in the same spirit of the post-colonial period right now, it is still um, government led mm -hmm. and in terms of the funding it's a mixed bag right okay. again going back to the thing that different countries are different levels so you have low income countries you have middle in lower middle income countries and yeah. low income countries but generally the move or the conversation is around sustainable domestic financing okay yeah can I tweak that question a little bit yeah all right so are governments able the way in which this care is envisioned in the minds of practitioners and experts and looking at the, the plan. Are governments able to initiate and sustain this plan with what we currently have? Um, in the current situation, I would say that um, no, that's mm. a short answer. But in terms of the fact that people have started to look at um, it's not just about increasing the money. It's mm. about doing well with the money you have. So that means increasing efficiencies. Mm -hmm. It's looking at making sure that we're using it more effectively. And it's also looking at where we can direct our investments, right? Because even healthcare, as much as, you know, we look at economy and look at infrastructure as things that we look to, look to invest in because they have a good return, healthcare is just the same, mm. right? Because you're looking at it not just in terms of something that we look at as a public good, mm -hmm. as something that is a human right. We're actually also looking at it as an investment. And I think COVID COVID-19 has shown us, you know, how the impact of healthcare, if you don't look at people's healthcare and make sure that health systems are strong enough to cope with that, then those investments, um, you know, kind of fall by the wayside. Um, so in terms of whether countries can, I think they definitely can. Mm. because there's the, But it's something that all other countries, if you look at even high income countries, middle income countries, particularly look at the Asian giants and those people who have a good healthcare system, as we call it, quote unquote, mm. It took time, right? Sure. But it started with small investments, starting off with things like primary health care. Mm -hmm. mm. So looking at that. You know, the story of uh, <clears throat> universal health care has a, a very nice ring to it. It's a pleasant ring. And if one were to be hopeful, it's one of the things that one would sort of like want to invest all their hopes in because it provides something that nothing else can in the way that it does. 
and often the discussion is about is the government able I, I, I find that that discussion is misplaced I would rather ask the question is the government willing that's 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 a that's a hard hitting question. Um, so you know, part of my role is um, you know where I work is to mix it between uh, working, collaborating with different actors, both state and non-state actors. And um, for the experience that I've had in terms of collaborating with state actors, there's definitely the the will. If you look at the context here, there's definitely the will to do so. Um, it's just that we have um, an institution. We have different institutions with different. Um, you know, things that you have to engage in, different people you have to engage in. Because remember, when you say government, government is a big animal, right? Um, there's so many different actors within the within government. And it's about also making sure that people understand the concept of universal health coverage and understanding that, for instance, one country, country A's universal health coverage picture or journey does not look like country B's. Mm -hmm. So that means you're trying to also understand people's uh, mindsets and, and figure that out. And then also contextualize all that you've heard about UHC um, into what that means for your country. So that's a challenge that governments often experience. And um, But I would say that in terms of the willingness from what I have experienced and from the discourse that I have been part of, mm. it's something that you've definitely seen. It's just a mixture of, of you know, how do you actually how do you actualize all these dreams right mm. um which is very difficult especially when you look at um in some countries the fiscal space is actually reducing and to deliver on this big dream as the dream we're seeing in like 20 30 years to start off by thinking of that you know dream that big investment that you'd need to make or the amount of money you'd have to have to make that sure. happen is is something difficult just just by by the situation by virtue of where we are yeah I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a bit frustrated. I mean, coupled with your optimism, <laughs> Doc, but um, I look at health and in coverage on the continent and I look at all these other competing factors and of, unfortunately health is an extremely dependent sector that is dependent on so many other things in order for it to work superfluously, as in it... it there is so much that is needed. You must have infrastructure that is in place, water running electricity uninterrupted, uh, proper infrastructure in terms of the mechanics that you need, uh, facilities, uh, pro uh, proper resource in terms of human resource. And then I look at some of these factors and they are the deliberating factors that are currently existing in a lot of the countries on the continent. And health is dependent on all of these things. How then will we say that things are looking up if unfortunately we can pinpoint some of these things as stifling issues. So actually, I would I would put that um, two ways, right? So the health is not only, as you say, it's dependent, but mm. I think it's also an anchor mm. for all those things to actually function, right? Mm. Um, so when you're looking at... Um, I'll give the example of, again, going back to COVID-19 and looking at how countries, um, you know, first of all, started their, 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 their focus or arranged themselves to kind of tackle this, yes, this yes. big giant, right? First, they did, they did one of the things that I think was one of the things we, we, we looked at recommending as something that people need to continue with mm -hmm. is multi-sectoral collaboration. Mm. So understanding that I look at health as an anchor. Health is actually, one, it's kind of like the, I think, um, the canary in the coal mine. It, mm -hmm. first of all, tells you, it gives you the pulse of what's going on mm -hmm. in your country, mm -hmm. but it also gives you an understanding of kind of like the layout of the landscape. So in co during COVID-19, um, especially in the initial throes of the pandemic, there was a lot of multi-sectoral action with health as a guide. Mm. So if you look at ministries, Ministry of um, Health in many countries was kind of the spearheader, like, like the leader. And yeah. people took lead from, from, the, from the Ministry of Health. Mm. And where you saw, um, you know, whether it was uh, when we're looking at food security, whether you're looking at infrastructure, making sure some of these things were put in place, the speed at which governments were able to act mm was something that we hadn't seen, like I, I pers in my lifetime, I hadn't seen it. And I think those are some of the things that we need to build on because we actually did really well, especially given the circumstances that we were in, fighting somebody, fighting a, you know, an enemy we did not know, mm -hmm. did not understand and did not see. Mm -hmm. So I think those are the kind of things that we need to build on. And for me, that's why I, I remain optimistic mm -hmm. because we have shown that we are able to, to do use it. that, to do it mm -hmm. and to work collaboratively. And so if we're able to use that and even use health again as the canary in the coal mine, as our indicator for 
whether all these other sectors are collaborating, are working well, mm. then I think that's the kind of the focus that we should we should kind of take. Mm. You talked about um, each country having its own picture of what UHC is all about. Yeah. You launched a report during this conference uh, called what? So it UHC was UHC in Africa. Yes. Yeah, so it was basically the state of UHC in Africa, mm. and it was a report that was launched by the A High Commission. So um, we usually have the Africa Health Agenda uh, International Conference, which is a two-year conf. It's it happens every two years, and in 2019, um, one of the things we did was we launched a commission, um, or there was a call for a commission that would be one Africa-led, mm. that would look into Africa, look into the healthcare context in Africa mm. and kind of develop a report that would give us the perspective on what exactly is going on in Africa when it comes to universal health coverage. Mm. There are many reports, of course, that do this. It's just that we wanted to make sure that this is this was something that we could do differently. And I think one of the things we tried to do with this, and, and I think we successfully did, was it's not just giving numbers. It's not just saying X percent was able to, you know, in terms of the traditional indicators, mm. we went a little bit further because we wanted to contextualize the challenges that many countries are having. Yeah. But then we and, and we looked at the challenges, his, both historical, we looked at, you know, the current health system, broader contextual challenges. So the things you're talking about, the mm. system, the system as a whole, supply side, demand side. And then we also went on to say, actually, mm. Africa is 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 a, is 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 ripe with opportunities, okay. right? So there are actually opportunities we can leverage. Mm. And that's what we identified in the report. And then thereafter, what we did is we also provided recommendations for different actors. Because as much as UHC is, again, government-led, it's government-spearheaded, we look at it as everyone's business, right? We look at it as everyone's job mm. to make sure that we succeed in this journey. Mm. Um, so that means we looked at recommendations for state actors and recommendations for non-state actors. But then something also unique we did with this report is that we didn't want to just, you know, it to be professionals who are just sitting down and writing a report. We went out and actually sought for community stories. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to contextualize those numbers. We wanted to say, if someone is saying that, you know, service coverage is difficult for them, they're not able to access services. We looked at an example. We looked at people who submitted stories and said that actually, yes, this is true or this is not true in my context, or this is what the major challenge is in my context. And this is what I can do to make sure that, um, you know, I'm able to access services or, you know, just kind of like making making sure that this is something that's tangible, that's visible for people and someone, everyone can understand and consume this report in that way. Mm. So from all that uh, research and study that was done, yeah. how diverse is the UHC picture in terms of the way governments have conceptualized in Africa? So are we are we talking about the same thing when you say UHC in Kenya versus UHC in Senegal, UHC in the Gambia? Is it the same thing we're talking about? So um, when, when you're looking at the design of universal health coverage in different countries, um, let me start with the fact that um, generally I think it's about uh, 50 out of the 54 countries that we found. So that's about 93% of countries actually have a, you know, a, a, a statement on universal health coverage. So there's actually a political commitment or there's a universal health coverage um, policy document or there's some guidance in terms of a framework that the country is operating on that is guiding them towards UHC. Mm -hmm. And that means that they have, you know, looked at the UHC tenets, which are three, which is looking at equitable access to care. It's looking at quality of that care. And it's also looking at financial protection. So that means you're not going falling into poverty as a result of trying to seek that care. Mm -hmm. So the way countries will design that is very different. Um, so that means that, for instance, if a country decides to look at how they will ensure financial protection, that could be through um, ensuring that they collect enough um, uh, funds to be able to include that in an insurance package, right? Mm -hmm. And that means that it can be a prepaid mechanism to make sure that people do not have to pay at the point of care. Because often that payment at the point of care is what diverts people from healthcare. Yes. And they often come too late, right? Mm -hmm. So a country might decide to go through the, you know, exclusive tax route where you pay directly to healthcare facilities as a government and then you have people just access that directly. Um, and then you could also have a situation where a, a country will say, we want to have our uh, a social insurer who will deliver on that and we will pay that social insurer and that social insurer will then pay providers. 
Um, so that's an example of one tenet, right? Mm. Um, so different countries, um, but we measure them based off of those three tenets, financial protection, service coverage, and, um, you know, equitable the, access. Yeah, equitable access mm. and the quality of that care. Okay, so then even as you were coming, putting this report together, mm -hmm. and uh, as you see the achievement, so obviously from what you've said and from what we understand, that UHC, achieving UHC, complete coverage is the end goal. And there are certain things that certain countries have already done and put in place. What are the recommendations then you're saying that need to happen to move this along? Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, when you look at the recommendations, um, I'll, I'll put them into kind of like uh, two aspects, right? So you have recommendations for state actors, right? Mm -hmm. So you have recommendations for different government arms. Um, so that could be legislators, that could be, you know, the policymakers, the people who sit in ministries of health. And then you also have that for implementers, the people who are actually the doers at the, at the um, community level. Mm -hmm. um, and each of those recommendations are broken down depending on, um, you know, kind of like the policy guidance that the country has. But when you're looking at the specific rec recommendations, the first one we're looking at is, is looking at uh, making sure that we continue the investments we made in, in during COVID-19 to kind of like see what has worked, what actually worked and how do we sustain those things. Another recommendation is for government is looking at how do you make sure that um, you, you, you invest in primary health care, yeah. right? Because primary health care is, you know, the start because that's where, that's a, ideally, that's the first point of care. You want to make sure that people have access to care. Um, they're able to see, even, even when they're well, they should actually be able to still go to a healthcare facility, mm -hmm. right, to maintain their health. Yeah. So looking at it an, in a more holistic approach, looking at it from communities, what do communities need? Then that also then shifts the another that also goes to another recommendation, which is really rethinking how we've designed our healthcare systems. What actually works for your country? Mm -hmm. What works for your community? What does your community want? So that means that um, governments will be responsible for looking at what exactly um, in your health system, based off of the design that may have been influenced again by looking at our historical um, past and looking at the colonial influences, what do we need to then shift back towards? what actually communities want. So part of that is looking at, you know, how we engage with community health workers. Um, and then looking at how, um, as government, you want to make sure that you're working in that collaborative nature that I had described. Right. Um, then now when you look at non-state actors, non-state actors are so diverse, right? Mm. So you have private sector where you have um, the for-profit versus not-for-profit sector. And then you also have civil society. So when you're looking at all of these different actors, all of these different um, institutions that work alongside the state, because remember we said that it's both state and non-state actors are responsible for kind of like spearing this forward. You want to make sure that, um, for instance, private sector are looking at how do we make sure that uh, we have better commodity security, for instance. So that means that how do we make sure that if we're able to, we manufacture things locally, we're able to reduce the prices, we're able to defragment the healthcare market. Because we've been able to um, we're actually in conversation right now, and I think this is one of the sideline conversations at the conference, was to ask about how can we make sure that we're able to purchase things at a cheaper price, uh -huh. right? Especially for the healthcare market. Mm -hmm. Because if I'm, I'm having to buy um, pharmaceuticals from external, um, you know, people external from Africa, and I'm buying them at a higher price, yet I can manufacture them locally, how do I make sure that I do so? Because that, again, infuses more money into the economy. It makes sure that I'm not paying like extremely high exorbitant prices, and I'm able to make sure that I'm secure com like in terms of commodities right yeah let's take a break at this point and then we continue the conversation it's uh coming up to half past seven joining us in the studio this morning is dr reese power lumbe she's a health policy advisor with amref health africa talking about the state of universal health coverage in africa what is africa looking at are we on course to having uhc across the continent are there some countries that are ahead of others in terms of implementation of this ideal of having universal health coverage this is a conversation we're having this morning keep it right here we'll be back shortly this is the situation room the only way to start your day spice up your life 24 7 around the world non-stop this is spice fm
Hey, it's getting hot in here. The media has greatly contributed to the moral rot that we experience in this country. I remember a senior politician telling me, point blank, nobody steals in the field, it's stolen in the granary. So my friend, if you are going to win an election, jipange kwa granary. I think we are suffering from Stockholm Syndrome. Our violator and abuser <laughs> is also our redeemer in our mind. The whole political class, the whole political institution is rotten. It is based on ideals that cannot progress our country forward. This is The Situation Room. The only way to start your day. 24-7, around the world, non-stop. This is Spice FM. Hello. Hello. Umesikia? Uh, nimesikia nini? Ujesikia habari? <laughs> Ebu wacha ni kuambie. Kile kimetokea. Hello. 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 Don't wait for hearsay. Dial star 550 star 2 hash to read the Nairobian e-paper from the convenience of your mobile phone for only 20 shillings from your telecom line and stay up to date. The hottest talk of town with no additional charges. This holiday season is all about kuji and joy. Kupiga sherehe na kuget lit uki get Showmax. Anza ku stream na upate more than you expected with the funny Showmax original film Baba Twins. How about jina lako kukua kwenye limelight as you feel the thrill with famous first and only on Showmax. And it's about kuchotwa na drama or holding on for dear continue life in Nairobi this morning. Um, rain coming down in certain part, most parts. We'll see highs of 22 and lows of 16 today. Nakuru at 17 degrees is cloudy highs of 24 and lows of 15 15 will also be the low in a rainy area at 15 going to highs of 20 and it's sunny at 16 in Eldoret highs of 23 and lows of 14 mostly cloudy conditions in Mombasa at 26 highs of 30 and lows of 25 Malindi is partly sunny at 27 highs of 30 and lows of 25 Kisumu cloudy conditions at 21 highs of 29 30 will be the high in Kakamega it's mostly cloudy at 21 we're looking at heavy thunderstorms in Kampala at 20 highs of 27 and lows of 19 while it's cloudy in Dar es Salaam at 27 with highs of 31. Johannesburg is cloudy at 30 highs of 22 and lows of 13. The Hamatan continues in Lagos skies at 24 with the highs of 34 and lows of 23. It's clear in Kinshasa at 24 with the highs of 33 back down to lows of 24. One hundred two point five Spice FM, Kisumu. The in and outbound traffic continues. The in and outbound traffic continues on Mombasa Road this morning, and uh, we are seeing that right around the Timara Daima stretch. Let's look at uh, Likoni Road, also where there's some traffic then going towards the interchange. The southern bypass not looking too bad um, this morning. The eastern bypass also taking a little bit of it. It's starting to build up here and there in the CBD, coming off a thicker superhighway, um, increasing a little bit in the direction of survey, uh, also coming out of Westlands, then towards Waiaki Ways, where we have some traffic. So let's... Uh, not too bad in most parts. And Gong Road also building up. It's about the size of it. Let's take a look in a short while on Spice of MKE on Twitter. That's how you can get in touch or text or 40127. So now as you talk about uh, Showmax, we've been talking about, oh, get yourself Showmax, get Showmax, www.showmax.com. How do you watch Showmax? You watch Showmax on a Showmax app. How do you get the Showmax app? It uh, lets you download shows and movies to watch offline. It's available for Android and Apple phones, tablets, smart TVs, media boxes, Xbox One and PS4. PS, did I say 4? PS4. Okay. Right. <laughs> PS4. Go to the App Store on your devices, search Showmax, select and download. And then to start watching, sign up at showmax.com. Follow the easy steps. Once you're a subscriber, log into the Showmax app on your device. Select what you want to watch. Hit play. When you receive a call, hit pause. Pick a call. Hit Resume. Play. Pick. Hit play. Watch until the end. Repeat. Hey, 25 minutes to 8. <laughs> Yeah.
Spice up your life. Mature, intelligent talk every morning. Spice up yourself. Mornings done right. 25 to 8. Dr. Rispa Walumbe is a very optimistic health policy advisor from Ambref Health Africa. Uh, she's telling us about universal health coverage and the continent. There is this little detail about the continent, mm. the population of its youth. The significance of that number, and the question has to be asked, when you're talking about UHC, do the youth have a role to play in the realization of this, do their numbers influence the thinking and the policies behind the implementation of the UHC program? And in the conference that you had in the findings that you came up with, what were the considerations that were made and the recommendations thereafter with regards to the youth? Um, so in terms of what, uh, you know, the youth can do, I, I feel like one of the things that I feel like they should be involved at all levels, right? Um, from the aspects of policy making to implementation of universal health coverage, um, all the way down to even monitoring it, right? And being that um, accountability partner um, for the government. So when you look at different um, things that the young people can do or youth can do, um, in terms of being involved in healthcare policy, that's something that is um, something that pe there are very many examples of how young people have been involved in healthcare policy. So, for instance, in terms of I think uh, there's an example of even having like a youth parliament and looking at what what happens in that context um, and and how they advise you know actual legislation, how they're able to put a pulse on what exactly is going on when it comes to healthcare. But I think the first step is one knowing that actually UHC is for everyone, including them, mm -hmm. um, and really just diving into the details, right? Because the devil is in the details. Mm -hmm. And those that's where you can either be disenfranchised or be empowered. Um, and, and part of that is making sure that you are in the conversation. You are not asking for a seat at the table. You are part of you know, all the seats, you are part of the table. You're part of the conversation. So that means that um, in terms of the recommendations that we made, it, it looks at making sure that people are consciously making sure that those people who are involved in this process should in, it should include young people it should have youth at the forefront in all levels particularly at the youth policy at the policy level um, where they're able to not only influence policy but also create it craft it alongside government uh, or even be part of government in that context but then um, on the other side I would also say for those who don't want to engage in policy directly they're able to look at the accountability aspect of it and they can look at accountability, not just in terms of the legislation or the policy. They can also be involved in terms of even looking at how the healthcare system is, is structured. Does it meet their needs? Does it meet the needs of young people? Does it meet the needs of, um, you know, uh, youth? Does it meet the needs of women and children and all these, all these different things, right? And I think that's where, um, again, working collaboratively with... Um, the government and, and the government also creating spaces very deliberately where that is allowed, where that is not not even allowed, but it's um, not even encouraged. I don't know. The, the word is to actually say it's very it's a very deliberate thought. It's something that's um, actually put in legislation where you have to make sure that you have included that. Right. And. There are also those traditional methods where we have, for instance, in Kenya, where you have things like public participation, especially when it comes to bills being created um, at the county level. That's one of the things that I think um, those are some of the ways that I think young people can get involved. And from my experience, especially when I would call myself not quite a youth, um, but um, when I was a young person, um, you know, I was working together with, um, <laughs> I know, you're, <laughs> you're laughing at me, but no, I, I, I think it's because by government standards, they say I've crossed to the bracket. So I'm like, okay, fine. Um, so, Accept and move on. <laughs> so in terms of uh, engagement, Engaging in, in policy making, um, one of the things that I used to do was actually, you know, sit alongside those conversations, be in those conversations, figure out what exactly is this animal called universal health coverage? What does healthcare for all really mean? And how can I be responsible for even crafting the papers that are taken to, you know, those high level meetings um, to be able to make sure that that engage, that includes the, the needs that I have? Mm. 
But yeah. is it from from the other side? So if you're still still on the youth agenda, yeah, um, and how the youth can then be involved in UHC and its policy from the other side, is it open in terms of receiving this input or this participation by youth? Because it would seem as though those who are crafting policy, those who are establishing policy, institutionalizing this policy, seem to be in this cabal of experts and nobody can really crack it. You know, it's got to be them and only them who understand what's going on. And any additional input is kind of like, okay, thank you very much, but then it's put in a box and forgotten about and we're going to carry on with what we're doing. So is there acceptance of this input on the other side? To the, I, I don't I don't think it's as good as it could be. Mm. Definitely not. Um, um, we need to make sure that um, young people are put in that conversation and not just seen as tokenistic or um, you know just putting them there for the sake of it for tech, uh, you know checking a box. Mm. It's to make sure that when they sit there, when somebody sits there in their authority, and I would even say some of these youth are the experts, right? You have those people who have who have the, the experience and they, they have that expertise in their own right mm -hmm. um, and they've established themselves in that capacity. And so I don't, I, 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 I have seen instances where young people actually leading the charge, actually guiding um, some of the conversations when it comes to government di direction. Yeah. Um, but I think it could definitely be done more because it has to be at scale. It can't just be the one or two people I see in a room when I walk into a room where policy is being crafted it can't be just those one or two people and it can't also just be um you have to have that high expertise mm. it should be that if you have a perspective if you have um a way that you see the healthcare system working that does not work for your community as a community if young people are even leaders of our communities right mm. so how do we make sure that that and i think that's a very strong recommendation mm. is the to the government not even to to young people mm -hmm. the strong recommendation we have to the government is create this uh, this this framework work where you are actually looking to us as the community, as the as the young people, as the women, whoever it may be, to have a, a situation where you can have that accountability framework, right? Mm -hmm. You can put them at the table, you can actually, and listen, not just put them there yeah. and then not listen, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. yeah. the, I understand the discussion around including the youth, mm -hmm. but when we talk about expertise, are we saying the same thing? Because whenever we talk expertise, the leaning is towards academia. The paper qualification that somebody has had, the number of papers that they have been involved in writing, the number of conferences they have attended, the presentations they have made, further education that they have, that's expertise. And yet, when you talk about something like UHC, the expertise that is required is lived experience. Because that is what informs what is necessary, what is needed, because they know, because they live it. If you study and you bring these individuals as participants in your study, you are not an expert in their life. You are an expert in that specific aspect that you have studied. But the real expert in the community is always the community. Now, when we have these conversations, are we saying that those who are at this conference and those who sample size individuals, do they also have this understanding that when they talk to the communities, they're talking to experts? Yeah, so um, thank you so much for that because I, I um, one of the things that we have one of the commissioners who um, not only looked at the colonial history that we had in the country, we had in, in, in Africa as a whole, but also looked at, you know, the role of communities because we've always looked at communities from, again, that colonial view that we are the experts and we are advising the community or we are telling the community what to do. Mm -hmm. um, but really the shift that um, in the conversation is really seeing the community as the leader. They're the ones to tell you exactly what they need, one, because uh, as you correctly said, they're experts in their life. Mm. They're experts in their experience. You cannot tell them what exactly they have done, what they should do. Um, you can, you, you work alongside them. You see how you can, you know, um, fully make sure that they've realized the, the, the situation that they need for their healthcare system. So part of what we did was looking at how we, we we've talked, the, I'll, I'll, if you hear this in global health discourse, there's a lot of talk of people-centered healthcare systems. Um, so making sure that you put people at the center and not look at it from the perspective of you're making this big healthcare system and you're trying to, you know, make sure it fits into this context of, of, of whatever country you're working in. 
but we are looking at it from the reverse. How do you collect what people, what exactly do people need and how do you reorient? And that's the big shift we're talking about, reorienting it towards what they need and get using their expertise, because I, I agree with you, that's, that's their expertise as guidance. Right. So definitely in terms of making sure that things are more people centered, looking at communities as experts, that's something that we're trying to uh, uh, that we recommend in this very strongly in this report. My, my question was mm -hmm. this partnership that you speak of mm -hmm. uh, delightfully eloquently. Mm -hmm. Is it really understood and practiced? So it's something that um, I is it practiced? Um, I would say that it's a mixed bag. From what I've observed, just in my small observation, um, why I'm saying that is because uh, they're very, again, deliberate conversations that people are having around that. Because people have observed that just the design of our health systems, the design of how we even engage in policy, it's made, it's based off of like those, those colonial hierarchies that were established, right? And there's, the, we, we didn't, and we didn't, look at it as we can actually shift that. And that's looking at that colonial narrative. It looks at it from a top-down approach. And that's why it's a very deliberate move that there are conversations around that, that people are trying to do a bo like a more bottom-up approach. Um, are they happening? In some cases, yes. Mm. Um, there are examples that I do, I have seen where communities are at the forefront in terms of sitting down and saying, no, this is not, this is not right. This is not what we want. Mm. Can you give us not, one of those yeah. examples? So in terms of like when you're looking at, um, I think the example was in South Africa. Um, and I think they also have a very strong, um, you know, approach to making sure that you have a very deliberate community involvement. Um, where when even the design of research, for instance, right? So research is traditionally where someone comes from the external part and then they come and, you know, they, they go and actually craft the entire research study outside of Africa. Yep. And then um, they come and do the research study and then they just ask the questions and, you know, and then that, that, that paper, after they've had that conversation, they go and give that document to a policymaker and say, "This is what you. This is what should be done based off of the research that we have we have conducted in your conducted. country." But right now, if you look at even how we look at how academia is 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 designed, mm -hmm. again, it's a very rigid rigid um, design in a sense. But I think one of the things that has been people are trying to do um, is really shift that, because one. Communities, uh, one desire. You you should actually come back. It's a. It's actually you're supposed to come back and actually tell them. It's so actually this is a requirement that must exactly. be in protocols. Mm. Exactly. That yeah. you must come back and tell them your exactly findings. Exactly what, what you found. Yeah. Yes. This is what you found. And is it? Is it? Does in, it in, represent in, the truth this, as you understand yeah, exactly, it? Yes. Mm. Exactly. Exactly. Mm. And so a lot that that part is a big failing in mm. terms of what has been happening um, on the continent. And now we're trying to say that. Um, how we even design this research should not be exclusively focusing on, you know, as an expert, me mm. who has gone to, you know, in the, in the, in the, I think they call them the ivory or marble towers, um, to come and just design that and then come and tell you, like, mm. this is what I want to ask. That's interesting as you say that, because I listen to CT often and he talks about whom they used when they, you know, in the field of research and HIV. And you'll find that the people that will be able to give you this expert advice are the people that we would often take for granted or forget yeah. about. Yeah. That people who suffer a disease, people whose families have been ravaged by the illness, would be able to give a better understanding of then what you ought to do. Those are the real experts. They are the yeah. experts. And you don't even attribute this, you, this, right. this, the information you've gotten so to here, them. Yeah. Yeah. So here yeah. we are calling you know, the folks who you know, inhabit these ivory towers, yeah. as you say, then come back here and then want to apply some knowledge which doesn't take into consideration the actual meat of the matter. So is it possible then from what you've said and what you've observed to flip the script when we look at UHC across the continent that it's the people who know for example um, where the pockets of certain diseases lie for example mm -hmm. they know who suffers what when. They know what they've been doing with young children who suffer things like dysentery and things like that. They have an understanding. How about involving beyond the experts and beyond the external influence to the actual people who have a feel of it, to me, you would be able to have 
a waterproof policy then that you can now apply and maybe even have almost like kind of a turnkey policy that then works because you've involved a real real situation not some amorphous thing that oftentimes we don't understand but you don't do even as we say this huh? there's a human element in all this huh? somebody gets the funding human being the funder has very clear desires of what they want the outcome to be uh -huh. The research is being conducted in your country because it actually can't be conducted in mm -hmm. the country where the money is coming from because, one, it may be too expensive to conduct it. And the ethical requirements and considerations in that country are far more stringent than ours. Mm -hmm. Here you can get away with stuff. Okay? So, the cost of doing what you are asking for is something that has been fought for for the longest time. Mm. Include the cost of formative work. Mm. This thing we're discussing. Before you even plan and write that, Get to understand these people first. Get their this, input. This is it. When you've gotten their input, then write this document that you want. Uh. The opposite is what happens. Yeah, and I think you have to have... Okay, I think one of the things that you have to recon uh, also reconcile is the fact that when we have these smaller examples of community dialogue where mm. communities are actually spearheading and saying no is no, this is not working, um, how we bring them to scale is w one of the things where we kind of tend to fail. And we're trying to figure out... Um, again, our recommendations are, don't provide like this, you know... They don't have all the answers, right? Mm. Um, but one of the things we say is that we think that they're catalytic in their nature, especially if they're adapted um, by by different actors, depending on what they see as as most useful for them. But I think that aspect of, um, you know, not, and I don't say just community dialogue for just saying community dialogue. Mm. I'm talking about when you talk about, um, you know, what exactly um, a primary healthcare system means for a community. Mm. It might be different in County A mm -hmm. versus County B. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. That means that it's more effective for you to do it that way because what do you want? You want people to have confidence in their healthcare system. Yep. You want them to even have that ownership of their healthcare system to say, I have confidence in the primary healthcare facility or whatever healthcare facility is near me. Mm. And even if it's a public facility, it is actually doing what I need it to do. Sure. And that means that in that design, and that's why we strongly recommend for us to have that shift. Mm. Because if you do not have that shift where you look at the community as your... As, as the anchor, right? As mm -hmm. the people-centered, when we say people-centered health systems, we're not talking about something that's nice to write in an academic paper. Sure. We're talking about how do you actually, how do you actualize that? And I think that's why we're saying, even after we provide these recommendations, how do we work or collaborate with countries? And by this, I don't just mean government. Mm -hmm. How do you collaborate with countries to say, I, we want to facilitate this? How do we, how do we make it actual what does it mean for you mm -hmm. how do you want to engage with it and that means not picking one recommendation like you know cherry picking the ones that are not only easiest but also the ones that actually will make a longer term impact for the community which is again at the heart of it that's who, that's who you're trying to impact that's who you're trying to make a difference mm -hmm. for yeah this well, i don't know whether it's a misconception or it's reality that when people talk about universal health coverage then there are those who interpret it to mean government provided health coverage and no space for private healthcare workers health workers or health providers to play is it is it is that the case or does uhc actually mean that private and public are working together collaboratively so I, I, it's the latter, <laughs> it's what you said, okay. right? So when you're looking at the role of private sector, um, and I, I keep emphasizing that this is everybody's business, so that means everyone has a role. And even though I mentioned earlier, one of the recommendations was around commodity security and defragmentation of healthcare markets. Even the private sector, as you look at it, you mentioned providers. Those mm -hmm. are the people who work at the point of service. They're those people who work at the point of manufacturing, right? Yeah. Um, they're also those people who work um, at different levels. They work at regulations. They work all... All these things. So one of the things that private sector does in terms of we, we when you look at the African content continent and you look at it kind of like a gen general way, mm. the private sector is actually quite rich, right? If you look at different countries, I think here in Kenya, it's it's a really vibrant private sector that we have, mm. and there's a lot of provision that is provided by 
private sector, mm. when you look at points of service, this is not just um, faith-based. This is also um, for-profit um, healthcare facilities. And it's not just the bigger names. It's also the smaller rural facilities um, that are run you know, by a small business owner who are providing care. Mm. So how do you make sure that you make, um, the environment is not just looking at it from f as the government from a regulatory perspective mm. where you just regulate, um, but you're looking at how do you integrate them into the system in a way that makes sense, right? So these are uh, some of the dialogues that I know have been happening are around cost of care. Because the cost of delivery of care in a private hospital is different from that in a public hospital. Mm. So as a government, the, the question is how do you make the balance where you're able to provide care from if, if a private facility is the main facility in, an, in a geographical area, mm -hmm. how do you include, how do you make sure you include them? Because you can't say, no, you just have to go to the public yeah. facility, which is much further. So part of the conversation is to say, okay, how do we engage with this private sector, whichever way we are paying, this private player, whichever way we are paying them, whether it's through insurance, through direct tax, how do, we, how do you integrate them into that process? So again, as, I, as you keep seeing me discuss things, I always shift back to the state actors because I still think that as the holders of the institutions, as the guide, the people who guide, you know, policy, who guide implementation, who guide the monitoring and evaluation, they still have a role to play. And, and that also includes creating that environment, mm. um, whether it's making sure that it's there's an ease of business for people to do their work and do their work without harassment or, you know, without fear or favor they're able to deliver, that's one of the things that government needs to do, whether it's for manufacturers, service providers, um, you know, and again, I really look at what happened during the initial phases of COVID-19 mm -hmm. as th that collaborative nature. We did it. We worked together. We brought things, we, you know, we were getting no help from external, external people, but we worked together internally, both private sector, public sector, civil society, you know, where we were engaging with, we are making sure that we're working with communities to see how we can reduce the spread to flatten the curve, mm -hmm. both public and private sector. And also, again, with the anchor at, as, as communities. You know why we ask this question? Yeah. yeah. If you look at uh, the statistics we have on hospitals, how many public hospitals do we have in the country? No, I, I'm not seeking an answer. I'm simply saying... If you compare them with the private hospitals, you'll find we have more private hospitals than we have exactly. public hospitals. Yeah. So if you're talking about UHC, in fact, it's almost double in terms of numbers. So if, if you're talking about UHC, the private hospitals have to become a key partner in this whole thing. It, it's, an, it's an unfortunate inversion because the same seems to apply to the education sector. Mm. You talk education, you cannot talk education in this country without talking about the private sector. Yeah. So the discussion about who gets involved they have to be involved. Mm -hmm. No, I completely agree with you. And that's why it's, it's um, I think if you look at the example again here in Kenya, you have such, as you said, you have such a vibrant healthcare sector, um, a private healthcare sector. So where you have private sector players. And as you talk about the numbers, actually those numbers are those smaller, smaller facilities, right? Mm -hmm. That are in the far flung areas and they're the ones who are actually providing care. Yeah. So how do you make sure that one, is there a way for government to, um, if, it's, if it's to make sure that this facility is able to deliver on their promise, mm -hmm. how do you share some of those costs? How do you reduce the cost of doing business? How do you make sure that the country, um, the government can, make smaller investments so you continue with your regulation regulatory role mm. but you continue to make those investments in a way that ensures you deliver care reduces on your cost as a government to be able to deliver that care mm. and encourages you know healthcare workers to deliver yeah and because the often the challenge as a as a healthcare worker um in my in my previous life um was you are at you are in a situation where you have the skills and the knowledge to be able to deliver, mm. but the infrastructure that is around you is not, it doesn't facilitate doesn't you to do so. support the work that you're doing. Yes. Dr. Walumbe, thank you very much for joining us. Dr. Rispa Walumbe is a health policy advisor with AMREF Health Africa. We've been talking about the state of universal health coverage in Africa, and this is off the back of a report that was launched during the Conference on Public Health in Africa, uh, held recently, and it's saying, well, there's very many steps that are being made towards attaining universal health coverage in Africa. Come again soon, Doc, so we can have more conversations like this. If you'll have me, yeah, sure. <laughs> we will. Keep it right here for more conversations. This is Kenya's biggest conversation, The Situation, Ramon Spice FM. It's now 8 a.m.
up your life. The Spice FM Newswire is brought to you by InDriver. Choose your preferred driver, mode of transport, and negotiate your fare to your destination for a safe, comfortable, and affordable trip only with InDriver. The latest news from around the world, 94.4 Spice FM. This is Newswire Dance Asset. The government has beefed up security in Mombasa and other coastal areas as thousands of visitors flock the city ahead of Christmas festivities. Coastal Regional Commissioner John Elungata said adequate security measures have been put in place to ensure the safety of local and international tourists visiting Mombasa and other coastal areas to celebrate Christmas and New Year holidays. Elungata, who was accompanied by the Coastal Regional Police Commander Manasim Msioka, asked the management of worship places and the general public to cooperate with the security personnel and volunteer information on any suspected person or illegal activities they may come across. Now, the Principal Secretary in the State Department for Early Learning and Basic Education, Julius John, has restated that students who are reported to have engaged in criminal activities will not be admitted once the schools reopen. The PS noted that this is just a fraction of some of the penalties to be meted out on those who have been participating in the destruction of property in learning institutions. It said this must be done in a bid to weed out bad characters from schools. The PS disclosed that the ministry is currently in possession of records of all the students who have masterminded as an attacks in secondary schools across the country. EAC Heads of State are set to convene for the 18th Extraordinary Summit of the EAC Heads of State, set to take place virtually tomorrow, Wednesday, 22nd of December 2021. The summit comes two days after the 45th Extraordinary Meeting of the EAC Council of Ministers. The summit is expected to consider two items, the report of the Council of Ministers on the admission of the EAC to the Democratic Republic of Congo into the EAC and the amendment of the quorum rule of the summit of EAC heads of state. The Council of Governors has decried a 398 million shillings reduction in the proposed recurrent expenditure budget selling for next financial year by the Commissioner on Revenue Allocation. With that next financial year expected to begin in June next year, just two months to the general election, the Council of Governors met to deliberate on the future of devolution pre- and post-election. The Council accused CRA of ignoring the uniqueness of different county governments as well as the fact that new administrations and MCAs will need induction after next year's general election in August. Deputy President William Ruto has promised the residents of the coastal region of Kenya that he will resolve the delicate land question in the area if elected president next year. The DP, who was in Mombasa, said he understands the land problem in the region and that he will institute appropriate measures that will ensure that these will no longer be an issue. According to Ruto, all the issues surrounding the land ownership in the region remain his major focus as he seeks to become the country's fifth president. He undertook to commission the second phase of issues to ownership documents that will see the land question dealt with and resolved for good. Now, use of outdated technologies and lack of cost-effective building solutions have been identified as factors hindering speedy construction of affordable houses. According to Kimoto Kimani, a real estate developer, the cost of construction in real estate sector could be greatly reduced if players in the industry adopt the use of solutions such as aluminium formwork that has been identified as affordable when compared to other materials. According to Kimani, the government has supported real estate developers of affordable housing units by ensuring horizontal infrastructure such as roads and sewer are available including fast-tracking issuance of title deeds and giving rebates on value-added tax. And a Tigrayan forces spokesperson has said that Tigrayan forces fighting the central government are withdrawing from neighboring regions in Ethiopia's north. This is seen as a step towards a possible ceasefire after major territorial gains by the Ethiopian military. The 13-month-old war in Africa's second most populous nation has destabilized an already fragile region, sent 60,000 refugees into Sudan, pulled Ethiopian soldiers away from war-ravaged Somalia, and sacked in armed forces from neighboring Eritrea. In a letter to the United Nations, TPLF spokesperson Debration Gabriel Michael also called for a no flying zone for hostile aircraft over Tigray, armed embargoes on Ethiopia and its ally Eritrea, and a UN mechanism to verify that external armed forces have withdrawn from Tigray, all requests that the Ethiopian government is likely to oppose. 
Now, recently elected National Olympic Committee of Kenya NOC Deputy Secretary General Shaib Vayani has been elected as first Vice President Africa Sports Shooting Federation on a four year term. Varani was elected during the Continental Shooting Federation's poll held in Cairo, Egypt. Shoaib, who was a board member 10 years ago before moving up to fourth president for eight years, pulled 16 of the 19 votes. This is Newswire Dennis Aceto. The Spice FM Newswire is brought to you by InDriver. Download the InDriver app from the App Store or Google Play Store to enjoy a safe, comfortable, and affordable ride around Nairobi. One hundred two point five Spice FM, Kisumu. Not too sticky of a traffic situation on the roads today, apart from certain parts of Mombasa Road, and that started pretty early today, and it still continues. We're looking at traffic then spilling off uh, North Airport Road and then going towards um, Outer Ring. That looks really messy this morning. And Jogo Road started early, didn't stop. Langata Road now joined pretty late, but some traffic there as well. Getting onto Kamkunji at the roundabout from Landis Road, that's also pretty sticky. Gong Road also, some traffic there this morning, and it has spilled off um from the thicker super highway we're going then closer and closer towards survey campbell road not so bad except further ahead going towards coffee garden that's where we'll see some extra traffic this morning limuru road also quite packed now uh yeah so traffic hour started late and likely to end a little bit earlier today but traffic has built up in some parts not to forget it is still slippery so we're going to see folks moving a little bit slower spice of mke on twitter text to us there text on 40127 This is The Situation Room, the home of hard-hitting political commentary and penetrating insights about the state of the nation. This is a talk radio experience like no other. The Situation Room, a place for hard truths, debates, and elevated conversations. The Situation Room, witty, political, engaging, deep, controversial. In the room, we have C.T. Muga, researcher, academic, seasoned political observer, a fountain of wisdom in these politically uncertain times. Ndu Oko, Nigerian by birth, Kenyan by choice, communications expert, pan-Africanist, a truth seeker and believer in people power, and Eric Latif. Agent provocateur, the man in the chair, seasoned journalist, news hound, a man who believes in punching up, not down. This is the Situation Room, the only way to start your eight day. Eight minutes after eight. Good morning. Thank you very much for keeping it locked on Spice FM or online, Spice FM, KE, YouTube or Facebook or Twitter. And if you're joining us now, good morning. Welcome to Kenya's Biggest conversation. There are people who have been watching. Watching from Isiolo is Manyala Odero Nicholas. Watching from uh, MCA James Muli says, watching live from Nyali, Mombasa. Huku kila maali ni giza. Heavy rainfall apparently in Mombasa. Raining cats and dogs. And Dalu is watching from Bungoma. Martin Wafula is watching from Ndalu in Bungoma. Right? Everybody, thank you very much from wherever you're tuned in. Today we have two proverbs, one about a finger, the other one about a monkey. <laughs> Chanda Chema Huvi uh -huh. Yes, that is the proverb of the finger. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the ring. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Not Lord of the Rings, uh -huh. finger of the ring. Uh -huh. right? Ring of the finger. Yeah, right, 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 right. Mkio Nyani. Haubanduki Nyani. Monkey tail, tail monkey. Mm. Where you go together, yes, like this. Where you go, I will go, and your people will be my people. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh -huh. governors, the county bosses, yeah, they're demanding cash for handovers. Mm. All right, cash exactly, for? handover, handover, handover. 
to the Meaning next. Meaning they hand over to the next person. Or not the cash, hand not handing over the cash. Not handing over the cash. <laughs> As they <laughs> hand over power either to the un incoming or to themselves. Yes. Money to facilitate uh, the assumption of office. Hmm? Money to facilitate. Mm. The assumption of office. Okay. See. Let me give you details. Please go ahead. All right. Governors want to be allocated millions of shillings in the coming financial year to splash on lavish inaugural ceremonies. They say funds have not been provided to welcome newly elected and re-elected governors, their deputies, and members of the county assembly after next year's general election. So they're looking ahead. And they're planning ahead and saying, look, whoever is going to win, whether it's the incumbent or whether it's you know, first time going for second term or it's fresh blood coming in, we have not allocated this money. It needs to be sorted out so that, you know, we can plan these you know, ceremonies and have that taken care of. It's not been sorted out. That needs to be done. Um, they add that the Commission of Revenue Allocation did not consider the costs that counties will incur to welcome new leadership when it's slashed to current expenditure. The CRA has set the budget ceiling for recurrent expenditure for the 2022-2023 financial year at 61.96 billion shillings, 399 million shillings less than what counties were allocated in the current financial year. Following a full council meeting of the COG yesterday, the county bosses oppose the CRA's budget ceiling. We also note that county assemblies' draft budget ceilings for the financial year 2022-2023 have not provided induction costs for the new leadership coming in after the 2022 general election. This is despite the fact that induction is a key component for onboarding of the new county leadership to ensure that there is a seamless transition. Without this party, essentially, the transition will not be complete. They push by the county bosses for additional money from the exchequer to spend on the inauguration ceremonies comes at a time the government is tightening its spending of free funds to free funds for the um, elections preparations. 2017, the governors retreated to Diani from December 14th to December 16th to induct new county leadership. President Uru Kenyatta attended the meeting. They also lament that the CRA has maintained budget ceilings for the cost of public participation in county legislation as well as the cost of operations and maintenance at the same level for the past four financial years. So, next year there will be an election. There will be new people elected. There will be returning individuals elected. In order for us to move from one government administration to the next, we need a ceremony to be able to induct mm. the new. And this has not been budgeted for. It's going to be a problem. Let's get it budgeted for now. There's sense to what they're saying. Mm. There is. Mm -hmm. Because if we just remove all the uh, drama and the reporting aside, mm -hmm. okay? So what has CRA done? CRA has cupped recurrent expenditure at a certain level mm -hmm. and said this is beyond this don't spend. Mm -hmm. This is on recurrent. Mm -hmm. And this recurrent is also need, needed to cover public participation, um, assumption of office, and transition into a new administration. Several counties know for sure they are going to have new administrations coming into office because their governors are running second term. They're not seeking re-election. So there will be new governments coming in. It's not just that ceremony of having a judge coming to swear in a new governor. It's also about the transition. New administration comes in, there will be new um, administration taking over office. So the preparation for that is required. That, is, that ceremony is required to happen by law, you cannot swear in a governor at uh, beyond a certain time. You cannot swear in a governor behind closed doors. It has got to be in a public place within a certain time. This must happen. And this is important in our democracy to show that there is tra that transition. We may look at it and say, oh, okay, they're spending money, but it has an important role that it plays. And I think what they're saying is if we cap the expenditure at this particular point, we are not factoring in that this is a new, there's the 2022-2023 financial year is coming, I mean, a new government is coming, is going to come in in the middle of this financial year. We need to factor that in. There's a point in what they're saying. There's something they're saying and a conversation needs to happen on that. So if you cap it, how does it impact this? Mm. If you cap it and say, you know, all the recurrent expenditure is going to the normal everyday things, how about now these extra things that need to happen? 
When we talk about public participation, not all counties have the same geographical landmass. There are some that are more diverse than others. You've got to facilitate public participation per unique car, per county according to its unique needs and circumstances. There's a point. The point is an extremely valid one. If we were uh. living in normal times, there was no COVID, there was no drought, there was no flooding, mm. there was no climate change ramifications, it would make sense. The conversation that rings in my ear and that ought in my mind that ought to be a priority is how do we deal with the challenges that we currently have and with the resources that we have? Because my reading of this is we want more resources for this. Yes, you do. But there are other competing interests that also require resources, which is a priority. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to have this whole process that we want at a minimized cost? And if there's a minimized cost, what is that minimal cost? Because, again, my reading of this is there is a way in which these things are done and the cost is what we know to be this. Mm -hmm. And we're saying, but what you've budgeted doesn't cater for it. Or am I misunderstanding it? And they've done a minimum cost, and that is what is not being catered for. We are not living in normal times. Mm. The situations that we have are not normal. We have more problems than we know what to do with. So in my mind, <coughs> these are normal circumstances. So any conversation about money cannot be the same conversation we've had in the past about money. When there wasn't a, a crippling situation. No, no. Um, Perhaps coming to the table with a bit more of a bargaining stance would make a little bit more sense right now. Because the same conversations are being had. There's a reason why caps were put. There's a reason why these budgeting mechanisms were put in place. Because obviously the, you know, the exchequer felt bled. That I, we just don't have enough. There's certain things that have been pending until tomorrow which have not been taken care of. So when you look at it like that, uh, even when the description is being given, it does appear or it looks like a frivolous expense. It looks like a luxurious expense that perhaps can be done in a different way with less that can be used uh, uh, or rather can be performed without the usual expense that's capped on. You know, because of the times in which you're dealing with, because mm. it's not the first thing that has gotten a boot the the axe. Yeah, there are many other but you things know, that have gotten you the know axe. though. CRA is not using the current times and all as the reason. CRA has not given that as the reason. Mm. Has not given what the reason is for maintaining the ceiling at this level. If we're saying that even the allocations to the counties in the next financial year are going to drop because of the dire situation that we are facing, we are faced with, that would be another conversation. Saying, you know what, the amount of money in uh, the division of revenue that's going to counties will go, is going to be less. That's a different thing. The amount of money in division of revenue is going to be more, actually, in the next year than it was in this financial year. The only thing that CRA is doing is it saying the cap for recurrent expenditure this much. And it's looking at recurrent expenditure from those recurrent things. And the council is basically coming and raising and saying, yes, however, the recurrent expenditure for next year is different from this year. Because next year there are more activities that require financing. Mm -hmm. And you have not factored in that there's something extra. So if I'm to finance that, in addition to what I financed this year, this year I did not have an assumption of office. I had recurrent of this kind of things that I needed to do. And you could see it made sense. So you needed to have factored in that next year is a different year. It's like a 2017 year. Mm -hmm. It's not like a 2019 year. <laughs> so, mm. is it possible that there was an omission or there was an error on the CRA's part to say, okay, hold on, we didn't actually factor in that we're dealing with an election here, and that had that been the case, then they would have said, okay, maybe we need to increase this a little bit here to take that into consideration. That's my reading of what the council of governors is saying. Yeah, no, that is very clear that that's what they're saying. There's omission of... It's very clear that that's what they're saying. Mm. I don't know that that's CRA's position. Um, un unfortunately, what we've, we've not heard here is whether CRA is saying, okay, you know what? Okay, so maybe we didn't take that into consideration. All right, put it back. I, I don't think that the importance of 2022 is lost on them. Do uh, an organization that deals with what CRA deals with on a yearly basis 
having taken into consideration all these details we keep talking about in the past. So in the present, they're certainly going to miss out on it. That's what and, I'm telling uh, you. And, and not it is not the significance of 2022 is not lost on them. I they are full so. aware. They're fully aware that 2022 is an election year and that there's going to be new people coming into the administrations here and there. They're aware. And still they maintain that position. Why do you think they did that? They don't think it's as important. Or that the other and the, can, and the Council of Governors is telling them, okay, mm. yeah, it's as important. Mm. You know and what? I stand with the Council of Governors. It's important. It's unfortunately that in this particular matter, the Council of Governors seem to have lost the plot completely. Mm. Mm. Yes, <laughs> because even if what they're saying is true and it is needful, it is not the conversation okay. you want to have now with all the challenges facing the country. Mm. Because it's coming out as we need more money. Yes. And the question I'm asking is, my friend, the other sectors <laughs> of this particular country that are in dire need of basics, they're in dire need of security, they're in dire need of food, mm. they're in dire need uh, of all these problems of disease that are taking place. And your focus is on mo more money for transition. Mm. That is a priority. How can it be a priority? How can it possibly be a priority? Can you have a transition without these costs? Mm. I dare say you could. Yeah. Minimum cost, I dare say you could. Mm. The times we're in, for the longest time, has been understood to be times where we are cutting costs. This conversation is not about cutting costs. No, it isn't. And it's unfortunate because you'll see that very many things that you would say perhaps were needed for the livelihood of the general citizen have also then, you know, not been given that attention. Certain things have been halted. So when you look at something like this, where you say, okay, actually it is possible to kind of tighten the belt a little bit and cut some extra string here and there, that you can actually have it done. I'm going to go with that there is less shilling right now to go across, to go around. So that is what is being taken into consideration where we say, okay, we can increase it, not because we're being mean, but just because the funds are not there. Okay. Yeah. You guys keep making noise, then you will tell us then how you're going to finance our campaigns. Just, people just don't Again, get it. If this Governor's <laughs> dilemma as CEC's eyeing elective posts are set to quit. There's something here that is actually um, a big issue, even if we ex just expand it, okay? So, according to the law, if you are serving as a public or state officer and you are going to seek an elective post, well, a public officer, and you're going to seek an elective post in the next election, you need to resign six months before the general election, right? That six months is February 9th next year. And the IBC has already reminded <sighs> everybody, if you are a public officer and you want to seek election by February, after February 9th, you need to have resigned. Now, many of these people we're talking about are people who are working in counties. For, for example, many CECs and chief officers in counties are already thinking, I want to go into an election. I want to seek an elective position. For example, Kisumu, the business marketing and cooperative executive Judith Atyang, is set to quit and join the race for woman representative. Professor, Anyang, uh, Professor Atyang, who previously headed the health docket before she was moved by Governor Anyang Nyongo in a reshuffle, will be seeking to unseat Rosa Buyu. I'm in the race, she said. Education CEC John Awiti wants to make a second stab at the Kisumu Town West seat. Awiti lost to Fort Kenya's Olagua Lodge in 2017. In Migori, trade executive Sheila Gati Mwita is set to face off with her warm water counterpart Sophie Dibra for the Migori woman rep. The duo will battle it out for the seat with nominated MP Danita Gatti. Public Service Management and Administration CEC is Iska Oluoch is eyeing the Awendo parliamentary seat. Agriculture Executive Valentin Ogongo wants to make a second stab at the Suna West parliamentary seat. In Tata six CECs have declared interest in various elective positions. Uh, <laughs> Governor Granton Samboja said yesterday that the executives have already expressed intent to quit. Six of them. In Nakuru, Peter Katie Katienya, the finance CEC in Governor Lee Kenyanjui's administration, is eyeing the Kurisoi South seat. Katienya, in October, was the talk of town after he erected a billboard in Keringet to mobilize for voter registration. All these are the counties. At the national level, we already know of various people who've expressed interest in vying for elective seats. Some principal secretaries, some cabinet secretaries, some senior officers in government.
you know, the, the dilemma <laughs> is yes. when a county executive committee that has 10 members suddenly falls short of six members. How do they carry on the mandate? Yes. You know, as you're speaking, and you went to Migori, I remember that, yes, their county secretary, a gentleman by the name of Mr. Christopher Rosana, uh -huh. is also vying for the governor's seat. Uh -huh. Yes. So now, same question arises. Now, that particular office is extremely important in the day-to-day -day running of the county. Yes. So then what happens? Then what happens? Because the requirements, as we very well know, you cannot vie for it and hold on to that particular to that office. No, you You've cannot. You've got to leave. You've got to leave. And you've been given up to six months to leave. Yes. Right? Now, as I was reading this, I was thinking, did we make a mistake by placing it too close? Is six months too close to an election? The argument could be, oh, you see, but a governor has a choice of appointing new people. So go through the entire appointment, nomination and vetting and appointment and the time is up, is, is, has lapsed. Imagine if our cabinet secretaries, right, if 10 or 15 of them wanted to go into elective politics next year at the national level. And then? So all 10, 15 resign by the 9th of February and they tell the president, thank you very much. I'm going to seek direct mandate from the people. The president is left without a cabinet that can even have quorum. What happens? He starts nominating, taking them to parliament, the National Assembly, to vet, to come back, to appoint. We don't have a cabinet in the meantime. Hmm. And what happens to decisions that have to be made in the cabinet? Yes. Does our constitution cater for that? Good question, isn't it? Yes. So there are people who understand these things better than we do. Hmm. Because I'm thinking, if it was a bit earlier, if we had said a year to an election, that gives the government of the day wiggle room. Because we are more or less, it, it appears like the drafters of, of the constitution and the law were focusing on the rights of the individual who wants to seek election. Hmm. But not on the public good. Does it work well for the public good? You know, as you say, I was actually thinking, what was the thinking behind this? Hmm. Because there was a thinking that guided this particular decision. What were they seeing? What had happened in the past with regards to public officers who are now vying for political... What happened? There's the accusation of abuse of office yes, yeah. and the state resources, <laughs> misuse of state resources. But, but they've been doing that throughout. So you're a minister <laughs> and it's official campaign season yes. and you're going for campaigns yes. using the official government vehicles mm. and official <laughs> government resources. So now to avoid that, before the official campaign season is declared, you are already out. But also, to make sure that you are still serving, I mean, we don't condemn you, we say, within six months, leave office. You know something, huh? Mm. I understand the thinking behind it, but somebody who wants to buy for office doesn't decide six months to an election that they want to start. <laughs> Definitely no, not. Yes. Yes. So if you are afraid that they're going to misuse uh, public resources, then perhaps it isn't, a year isn't enough. Mm probably even two years, because they are going to misuse public resources and they're going to misuse their position to ensure that they entrench themselves and put themselves in a favorable position to be elected. They are going to, long before those six months. Mm. Mm -hmm. By the time the six months have arrived, they are prepared. I'm thinking if we actually just made it a year, okay? Yes. That's enough buffer for both sides. Mm. It's enough buffer for you have a year less to misuse the office that you've been given. Uh, at least you, you've, you reduced, <laughs> you've yeah. reduced. And you, on the other side, have a year to figure out how your operations will continue yes. running smoothly when this individual is out. The interests of the public are going to be t taken care of because within that year, the government in office is going to be able to appoint replacements. Mm. Albeit temporary. And, and business can continue. And business can, can continue. continue. Imagine if February next year, IG Mutiambai resigns. He wants to buy somewhere. Okay? He's mm. the Inspector General of Police. Matiangi resigns, he wants to vie somewhere. Kebicho resigns, he wants to vie somewhere. Those three, they leave mm -hmm. because they're going to vie within six months' time. And we are talking about securing the election. And these are the people who are charged with that, with that, with duty. that responsibility. Yes, yeah. yes. You know, and then there's a process of appointment. Yes. It's not like Eric, in the, so in the so midst so of a campaign. Said, Eric, just go and take that docket. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. quite work like in that. In the midst it? of a campaign, 
where all those factors are going to be before the parliamentary vetting committee. They're thinking, aha, so you uh, have been nominated to be the next security minister. Good for you. Come. It's campaign season. Kuja. Let me show you how this thing is done. Yeah. You know you'll be at sea. Ping pong games, delaying, rejecting, doing all manner of things. My friend, they will run circles around you. Yeah. If people who've been there for years have circles being run around them, what about somebody, a newbie, somebody who's just come into the seat? You simply will not know what hit you. You've been at a loss. Mm. Let's take a break and uh, we shall be looking at other things that are making headlines both locally and internationally. The Tigrayans have gone back to Tigray. After having come so close to the capital, the capital Addis Ababa, by weekend, they would have been in, in Addis Ababa and Abi Ahmed would have flown off to exile. I've come to Kenya. Things changed. Half past eight. This is Kenya's biggest conversation, The Situation Room. This is The Situation Room. The only way to start your day. Spice up your life. 24-7, around the world, non-stop. This is Spice FM. Have you seen the... Am I like? Yes, yes. It's a very nice uh, outfit, I mm. must say. Good thank job. you. Asante Sam. The compliment is well received. Good morning and thank you. Evan Nwasingishi was asking me what channel is Spice FM. <laughs> 96.7. <laughs> Tell them that. Right. Yes, now they know. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Pleasure to have what you. What a beautiful friend. studio, my friend. <laughs> I've been to other radio stations, but I've never seen anything like this. Thank you. Thank you. And it's very nice to be in a modern studio. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. And I have to say, uh, it's a very cool ambiance here in your uh, radio room. Uh, just for our listeners, I think it is uh, below zero in this uh, room here. The weather with Spice FM. The rain keeps coming down in Nairobi. Today we will see highs of 22 and lows of 16. 19 degrees and cloudy in Nakuru. Highs of 24 and lows of 15. 20 will be the high in Yeri where it's raining at 17. We'll see lows of 16. Mostly cloudy conditions in Eldred at 19. Highs of 23 and lows of 14. Mombasa is sunny at 27. With highs of 30, we'll see lows of 25. And in Malindi, raining at 28. Highs of 31 and lows of 25 as well. It's mostly cloudy at 22 in Kisumu. Highs of 29 and lows of 19 and we're looking at mostly cloudy conditions at 24 in Kakamega with highs of 30 and lows of 17. Kampala is mostly cloudy at 23, highs of 26. Those thunderstorms have abated just a tad. Mostly cloudy conditions at 28 in Dar es Salaam, highs of 31 and lows of 26. Lagos still continues with that haze over the city at 23, highs of 34 and in Johannesburg it's cloudy at 15, highs of 22 and lows of 14. Kinshasa is sunny at 24, that'll be today's low going to highs of 33. All right, some traffic coming off Cabanas going then towards uh, North Airport Road and then Embakasi out towards Outer Ring. Uh, that slows down significantly. We're looking at the Southern Bypass also. What would be your escape route? Some traffic there. As you're going out then towards Langata Road, things slow down as well. Uhuru Highway joins as does Ngong Road. Bits and pockets of traffic here and there along Jogo Road going then out into uh, Landy's Road and then out towards the city. Haile Selassie, heavy traffic today inbound and uh, the CBD continues to be chocker blocked We're looking at bumper to bumper traffic very close to the Pangani underpass today coming out then from Kembu Road as well as Limuru Road this morning. It continues with the weather. Spice FMKE on Twitter. Talk to us there. Text on 40127. It's a festive season. How about you think of gifting somebody the very wonderful Showmax? Yes, www.showmax.com. Go there and find out all the great details of what you can get with Showmax. And you get access to Showmax. Choose the package that you want. Gift somebody Showmax this festive season. Children's programming, Showmax. Your favorite shows, TV series, Showmax. Documentaries, Showmax. Movies, Showmax. There are some even that are Showmax originals. Mm. Commissioned by Showmax, posted on Showmax, or first on Showmax before they even go on to other platforms. 
All this entertainment content is available on Showmax. And if you go for Showmax Pro, you get sport content, live sports, in addition to all the entertainment content. What are you waiting for? www.showmax.com Mature, intelligent talk every morning. Spice up yourself. Twenty-five Morning's minutes. Done right. So what's happening in Ethiopia, City? You know, uh, a lot is happening in Ethiopia. Uh, uh, um, and even as we hear and as we read about. Uh, should we say the easing tensions yeah. with the withdrawals of the Tigrayans? Yes. The question that I ask is that the problem that made a conflict arise and then escalate with what has taken place, mm. with the war that then took place, mm. were the wounds not exacerbated? Were they not made worse? So if there were issues prior to that and issues that led to the conflict, have those issues be, have they understood that there's a path towards resolving the issue? Mm. And the leaders are on both sides, the Prime Minister and, uh, the, the, and, 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 the, and the leaders of the Liberation Front of the Tigrayans, are they having conversations that will bring, to la that will bring about lasting peace? Because a ceasefire doesn't mean that you've solved the problem. Mm -mm. It just means you've weighed your situation and the ceasefire is in your interest at that particular point in time. Mm. And the question I'm asking, the reason, let me explain why I'm asking this question. Okay? Uh, uh. I look at Uganda, I look at Rwanda. The time Museveni and his troops came in to Uganda, came into Kampala and took charge. There were people who had been there and they fled into Congo. When Kagame and his people came in, there were people who fled into Congo. Mm. To date, one doesn't hear of it often enough, but there are always problems with people who are causing problems on the border and people who feel that they want to come back to rule. Mm. Okay? Now, if we were to use that as an example, are we then saying that the situation in Ethiopia is any different? That now there's a talk of ceasefire. There's a, a cessation of hostilities. Mm. That the problems that brought about this conflict in the pl first place have been sorted and ironed or out. Or they, they, they are on the path to sorting mm. it out. And sorting it out for how long? Mm. It's not clear. <laughs> Remember, not clear the happened. government had branded these guys a terrorist group. They had. Okay. Uh, all the calls by, for example, Lucia Gunobasanjo, the African leaders, the African Union, and even the American government to have some sort of a talk was not moving anywhere. No, it wasn't. Eventually, they will have to have some sort of a con conversation, you know, some sort of a conversation. But the question you're asking, City, is does it get to address the root cause of the issues no. in uh, this country? I think especially because the, reason, the reasons for ceasefire could be various. Yep. That you look at and say... Uh, is there a certain side that ran out of the proverbial steam and said, all right, let's retreat and then regroup? And then it can be seen as a ceasefire, which is kind of like walking on eggshells. Mm -hmm. Or is it that, are they actually at the place where they said, all right, folks, we can actually discuss this thing. Instead of us going to war, we can actually have a conversation. The reasons for ceasefire could vary. And you cannot then say, based on that, are we all right? No, because then all you will have is a volatile situation whereby there could be the perceived notion of peace, but is actually not true. And what that does is that it creates a perfect recipe for this thing to come up again in the very near future. Yeah. Ceasefire, we've seen many. Just look across Somalia, Sudan, South Sudan. How many times have you heard ceasefire? And then within no time, it's up again. <laughs> Why is that? Because 
it could be that it was not a real situation of peace. It's that, all right, we ceased for certain reasons. We ceased to, we ceased to go and regroup. It's a temporary one. It's very temporary. Mm, yeah, strategic uh, ceasefire. As you're saying that we are seizing hostilities, we are regrouping, we exactly. are organizing, we, we, go back we still to our want dens. you out of office. Yes, we go back to our dens to see can we go about this a different way? Because clearly the conversation or the dialogue is not working and we actually are not interested in dialogue because we've tried it before, it has not worked. So are we going to try a different way or a different tactic? Okay. You know, if you have 9.4 million people needing to eat and needing food and facing starvation, because that's the situation we have in Ethiopia. Mm. Are you telling me that this is being taken care of? How then? Because that fight also decimated crops. It did. It decimated harvests. It's not been sorted. What about the people who left the regions where they were living in and went to neighboring countries? And became mm. refugees. Yes. Yeah. How do you solve that? You see, it's an upheaval. And people do not forget those things in a hurry. Yeah. This is the problem. And that's why certain conflicts never end. Yeah. Because the community memory on that thing... You give it enough time, man, it becomes a vendetta. It's something that people talk about it as though it happened two years ago or yesterday. And the thing is 2,000 years old. Mm. Yes. Why do you think Yugoslavia blew up after Tito died and the hold he had on that particular? Why do you think that happened? Because people were holding on to what they saw as injustices. People are holding on to what they saw at, as generational suffering. Yes. And they said, okay, fine. This thing that was holding kind of things together is gone. Now, let us come back and remember what happened over the last how many so years. Another conflict. It's millennia. Because mm. some of those issues began with the Ottoman Empire. It's another conflict. Yes. But we didn't have an opportunity to let things explode. But because now. there would be a would-be peace that was being held, kind of like a band-aid holding together you know, different fissures here and there. Mm. But then now that is gone. The band-aid is gone. All right, let's deal with those and issues. And then look at their tribal leaders mm. who now wanted ruling. It's always in the name of the people, of course. Yeah. But when you look at the suffering that people undergo to attain this, you realize this thing was never for these people. It was for this person. You know what this is like? It's like you have an, a disagreement, right? Uh, and then the sun sets. You go to bed or whatever. You wake up in the morning and you didn't deal with the issue over which you had an you're just like oh, okay okay we're just moving along it'll rear its ugly head somewhere down the line it always does it will if those issues are not dealt with whether it's diplomatically whether it's bilaterally unilaterally uh, multilaterally if you don't deal with it it's going to come up this conflict that we are seeing in Ethiopia as as many others is not the first time it has reared its ugly head it's not and because of this same thing, you put a cap on it and hope that things simmer for some time and then you can forget about it for the meantime, it'll come back up. You know, when you look at stable countries or countries that appear to be stable and you follow the history of what they went through to get to that stability, some of it is unpleasant. It's mm. ugly. It's, it's beyond ugly. People look at China and say China is a stable country. Do they know what that country has gone through to get to where it is today? The time when Mao and his troops were fighting the Kuomintang. The time when, hey, followed by the Great Famine. I mean, you read that history and you think and you say, good, you mean people go through all these things. But the resolute nature of those leaders, they said, look, we have to do something for the people. Now, I look at China and I say, those leaders were doing something for their people. Mm. At what cost, though? because the people who died in the conflict, the people who were part of the imperial dynasties and so forth, were also citizens of China. Yeah. Look at any area of this particular world we live in where there's conflict, and look at the stories. Successful leaders who brought wearing factions together exist. Mm. Otto von Bismarck in Germany did so. Garibaldi did so in Italy. But... What did they do to do those things? You know, they didn't have roundtable conferences and talk nice to people. No, 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 no. It was some of the bloodiest Bl times yes, ever. Yes. Brutal and bloody. To get a point across, it was not a conversation across the table no, like you say. No. And it was by acts and the shedding of blood. Lots and lots and lots of it. Mm -hmm. Now, why is it that human beings feel that to arrive at a point where you can have lasting peace? Look at even the world wars. It's like for there to be peace on the planet. There has to be war. A serious war where people go and say, whoa, whoa, whoa. We don't in Swahili they say, Amani haiji ila kwa 
Ncha ya upanga. Yes. Mm-hmm. No peace without bloodletting. So, tell me. There has got to be some conflict. Why? Because as you're coming to tell people about, you know, a certain se- selling your idea and ideology in a certain way, the people will sit back there and they're not seeing what you're saying. They never do see what you're saying. Yeah. And there are people who even when they see, they still don't see. They still don't see. So you've got to make them see. Yes. Now you tell me. The path that has been chosen. You know, one of the reasons why I am grateful that we live in this country. Mm. Okay? We complain about corruption and we should. Yep. We speak loudly against it and we must. Yep. But I honestly prefer a country where we bribe our way out of problems <laughs> that goes to than where you shoot your way out of problems. <laughs> in terms of preference. Mm. Huh? The less of the two evils. Mm. I prefer this one where people call you to talk to you and give you money so that you can shut up. As Eric says, shut up. Mm. Hmm? Mm. I, I, it is to be preferred. It is easy to move away from that than one where blood has been shed. That one people do not get over in a day. They will pretend, but they hold on to it. So, is it, is it the case for both, in both uh, cases? Even where you've called somebody to bribe them and you know, ask them to shut up, it's one person who has gone in, their leader, to go and shut up. They were representing others. And the others, just, they just lack leadership now. But the, the issues still seem... That's why we're talking about historical injustices. Eric, look at the Kenyan model. Eh? Yeah. Look at the Kenyan model of Shalap. Eh? Mm. Okay? At every level, everyone... It is an unwritten rule of how you can acquire what everybody... It, 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 it's public participation. Mm. Okay? Everybody is allowed to participate in stealing. <laughs> yeah, yes, mm. at your level. It's an accepted practice in this country. Don't think of it in any other light. That's why every time something happens, you get the impression, hey, so what are they negotiating for this time? Something but, goes to parliament. Uh, we always ask that question. Now you tell me, which Kenyan do you come across? They're there, but they're very few. Mm. Who isn't a tenderpreneur? Who sees a problem as an opportunity? Mm. It is the culture we have cultivated and it's the culture that we have that's what i'm saying our model works we've devolved it it just pacifies the issues for a moment so you see look at the big issues big community issues all right there are those that feel you know we've been marginalized for long and the government has actually had a deliberate policy of oppressing us and suppressing our voices and then what happens they just pick a few people from our community go and sit them up there and they bribe them. And the rest of us are left suffering. So now we don't have a leader. Every time we have a leader, a leader emerges. That leader is plucked, that leader is given something and made to shut up. The issue continues. Eric, it does. So that one point where it blows up and the issue becomes a whole big issue of, you know, it's blowing up. Eric, it does. Mm. And part of the reason is because there are communities that like lack a diversity of leaders to at least represent them. They have one or two people who stand out yeah. and they join that fray mm. of eating. And unfortunately, they disenfranchise the people they represent completely in that mm. process. So you are right. That wound doesn't, isn't just exacerbated, it festers. It is true, it does. Mm. What I was saying was this, tongue in cheek here, mm. that when you look at the options of the issues that arise and that bring about conflict, what I am saying eventually will bring some serious conflict. There's no question about it. Mm. And we've seen it. It will bring conflict. All right? What are the Mau Mau uprising about? You know, it didn't start with Ati Mau Mau. No, 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 no. It didn't start there. If you understand the history of Central Kenya, one of the first things that very many people in Central Kenya leaders understood was this education the white man is giving us doesn't really suit our needs. Mm. It's not what we need. No, no, no. Right so they began their own independent schools. Mm. An issue. They realize, yes, education is important, but this particular one is not meeting our needs. So let's set up things that meet our needs. Mm-hmm. It took world wars, one and then two, for people to realize, wait a moment, we just die like everybody else. They can be <laughs> defeated. Yes. It's the history of many countries that were colonized. They were engaged in the war. They came back, their eyes were open. They said, no, 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 no. we're not putting up with this. Mm. I am simply saying that devolution 
will be that little key that opens people's eyes. Because local leaders have always escaped by pointing fingers upwards to the national government. You can't do that anymore. Because you have money mm. locally. So yes, Eric, what you say is true. It will blow up. But it's going to blow up because you in your county, you have money. And the question will be, what have you done with money? Remember, I asked this question yesterday. Mm. You're listening. Just do the maths of the money your county has received in these nine years. And ask yourself... And ask yourself what you could have actually done with it. And Do you see mm. uh, if it's 100 million, a billion, sorry, 140 billion, 200 billion, whatever it is. Yeah. Do the maths and ask yourself, do you see this money reflected in your county? Yes. <laughs> That's an answer to you in the, agreeing with him, or you're saying, you Yeah, having gone to several in, counties, I've okay. seen mm. the new buildings that have come up there, new the businesses that have been set up there. You know, people the, the who are now living, up, they don't people who are living lavishly. <laughs> Eric, did you not ask whether they've been whether they are owned by county? Eric. Have I seen where that money has gone? Yes, I see where you're going with that answer, and Eric, I understand, and thank you. <laughs> You do see where the money has gone. Yes. Yes, you do. You can see where the money has gone. Yes. If you ask a different question in terms of how it has benefited has that the money people benefited of the county. You? Now, that's a different uh, that's question. A different question. Can, 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 that I, is a subjective can I rephrase issue. my question? <laughs> of all the plans that your county had for utilizing the resources they have, uh, have you seen a fulfillment of these plans? Uh, Building this, putting up this, pipe this, this, the other. Have you seen those things? Mm. And if you do, is it in the same measure as the money that they claim to have spent on these very projects? Is no, that that's, a, that's, a, that's a different, a different a, question. That's a different question. Thank you, Eric. Mm. Mm. That's a different question. Which so, actually also brings me to the point of... Remember there was a clip that was going around uh, with Museveni? Yes. Uh, I think it was the head of the Corrup Anti-Corruption Commission uh, talking about calling for lifestyle audits for civil public servants mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, in Uganda and saying we're going to commence conducting lifestyle audits to see are you living a lifestyle that is supported by the known incomes that you have. And then the president stood up and said, you know, this lifestyle audit, let's not so be, you know, we are lucky. We are lucky that the people who are stealing from us are spending within our, <laughs> our community. Now, if they were taking that money outside. If they were taking the money outside, that would be a different thing. But now they steal the money they spend within here. And I thought, it's the same thing for Kenya. Mm -mm. We are lucky because the majority of the people who steal from us are spending this money Eric, here. The majority yeah. does not represent the quantity that is stolen. <laughs> there are a few who represent us and then over-represent us. In, if you're talking about amounts, those ones don't keep the money here. So where is it? By the time we're having conversations about money outside the country, and Kenya saying, Nani, return the money, we'll forgive you. Just, re Just return it. Return like the money. Even in Quantum City, the, people, the majority of the money stolen in Kenya is circulating in Kenya. I will not argue that point of view because mm. I don't have the facts. Because just looking at, look at, we're talking about counties, right? In all the 47 counties, and you've seen ESCC opening cases across the 47 counties. Mm -hmm. And then we see the Assets Recovery Agency going to court, seeking to attach properties acquired through proceeds from this stolen money. They attach local bank accounts. They attach local buildings. They attach local parcels of land. They attach local local investments. Hardly do you hear them going to apply for some extradition of money from elsewhere this or asking the AG. These are low-hanging fruits, Chief. Mm. The a lot the of what the we big see. Fish. Yes. The a big lot of fish. what we see, even in the national level, when we see attachment, attachment, a former governor here, all his bank accounts frozen, attached, attached, attached. A, a former cabinet secretary, bank accounts frozen, attached, attached, attached. Look at how much. I personally am not too impressed by that because... Mm. Uh, I'm a Kenyan living in Kenya, and I know Kenyans. It's attached. So are they, I have to ask the questions. Uh. Are they negotiating or are they really attached? If we look at the Gishuru and Okemo case, yeah. it would discourage anyone from trying to get money abroad. In Indeed. That yeah. Yeah. You say, no, that one, we'll look into it later. But the ones which are here, yeah. I'm calling them low-hanging fruit. Even the ones abroad. We've seen one where there was an attempt to attach some property in Dubai. Recently, How in a recent case, it's still going on in court. Mm -hmm. Okay, but the issue is the indicator for me is the number of at local attachments. Attach block of flats here, attach house there, attach piece of land here, attach money found in homes there. 
All this money is being stolen, it's circulating here. It is helping, it is supporting. Who does it support? It's helping the construction industry in Kenya. It's helping the real estate industry in Kenya. Instead it's of help- it to be injected into <laughs> where it originally was. Yeah, 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 yeah. but it's so circulating okay, here. Because we can't really it's get it here. and it's being stolen, it's better that it's being spent here. No, 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 no. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, that's no, what no, you're saying. It's, it's better already, that it's being spent It's already here. being stolen. Yeah. It's already been stolen and it's the being se- spent the, here. So the saving better. grace is that it's at least being spent here. It's being spent here. Can you note how bizarre this conversation is? Can you imagine? <laughs> That's what we are saying. I'm not supporting the stealing. Mm. I know I'm just not. saying. I know you're not. I'm just saying. It is a saving grace. Mm. That unlike in this other one case that we are seeing, the, the, the island of Jersey, where money went and money is there. And we're talking about how we can ever get that money in this generation or two mm. back to this country. These other ones go to court, attach a hundred million, five hundred million, six hundred million, pick a vehicle, pick a piece of land here. That means that this person went and bought a piece of land from somebody. Use the money locally. Use the money locally. That means that this person <laughs> built a how a whole block of apartments. Employed locals. Employed locals. Got local material from China. Yes, got local material from our local cement factory, factories. Okay? Yes, they imported. Used local uh, clearing agents to clear the goods. The question then has to be asked. Huh? Mm. Mm. The scenario we paint is a realistic one, but it's also daunting. That we can have this conversation and speak about it as though it's normal, mm. is what I find bizarre. Because it points to how we've normalized wrong and we've accepted it as okay. And actually, it isn't okay. Mm. See, the tale about the theft, Eric, and everything that you said is true. But the other side of the coin is, what was that money purposed for? And how many people have been disadvantaged and disenfranchised as a and result of that money? Yes, exactly. So if we're to balance him, quantum if we were to balance it that what it could have done when you continue to see the things For that the you see on good. a daily basis yes. that there's a lack in this area that area that other thing and that it can be attributed to a few because that's what we're talking about make a comparison between those who suffer and the few who benefit after having now taken what uh, Eric, look theirs. at the conversation we're having yesterday with regards to the nairobi metropolitan services mm. and what it cost them to build 20 new hospitals huh? mm. And we said, but every county, given the money they've received, could have put aside a billion shillings and done the same thing. Meaning, every county could have had 20 new facilities. In a year? Yes. They could have. Clean. So that the following year, they're talking about schools. The, the year after that, they're talking about something else. Mm. One, one billion. In fact, it's not even a complete billion. Mm. So, public good. And then you'll find that somebody has stolen 10 billion. You're thinking, Ooh. And it's still, on, it's still on the thieving path. Yes. And still Another wants, one, and still wants billion. to continue. Another one, 800 million. You see, for me, that's the benchmark. So this guy stole 20 hospitals. Okay. This 20. guy robbed, or this person robbed uh, so many Kenyans. How many did we hear going to hospital per day? Thousands of Kenyans, the opportunity to go and get health care. Mm. On a daily basis. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and you see, the compensation for it yes. was the new building that the person put up in town and the big house that he put and the people who are employed. So I'm thinking, and the exchange for that is the health care the person ought to have received, not him, his family, and posterity. No, 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 no. It's not in exchange for. It is in exchange because it's that not. is money that could have gone yes, yes. towards that public good. It didn't. It's, of course it didn't. And, you know... I, I'm able to separate those two issues. There's a bigger picture that theft should not have happened. And once you're caught, you lose everything that you stole and then criminal proceeding is instituted against you and you go to jail. Okay? Mm. They're losing everything that you stole. I'm, I'm completely in agreement with that and that's what I'm talking about attachment. And then I'm saying that it was locally spent. Means it's easier for us to recover and means that in the time, there's some little interest. So you're saying that if it was spent externally, Can the you imagine process of being able to go and start retrieving all of it and then get you to uh, become so difficult that even those people that you say would have been able to help out here 
it will be centuries have. before it even happens. Yes. But here, you know, okay, there's a trail, this building, so we can now bring the building back, bring it, then take this person to jail. Mm. And also look at during the time when this building was put up, there's somebody who was able to feed their family because they were supplying, working, offering a service in the construction of this. Keep it right here for conversations that continue. 0719012600. You can join our conversations on Spice FM KE, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can post your comments. It's now 9 a.m. Spice up your life. The Spice FM Newswire is brought to you by Indriver. Choose your preferred driver, mode of transport, and negotiate your fare to your destination for a safe, comfortable, and affordable trip only with InDriver. The latest news from around the world, 94.4 Spice FM. This is Newswire. I'm Dennis Aceto. EAC Heads of State are set to convene for the 18th Extraordinary Summit of the EAC Heads of State set to take place virtually tomorrow, Wednesday, December 22nd. The summit comes two days after the 45th Extraordinary Meeting of the EAC Council of Ministers. The summit is expected to consider two items. The report of the Council of Ministers on the admission of the Democratic Republic of Congo into the EAC and amendment of the quorum rules of the Summit of EAC Heads of State. Our students who engage in arson activities in schools or have any criminal record will not be reporting back to school next education calendar or get transferred to any institution. The principal secretary in the State Department for Army Learning and Basic Education, Julius John, has restated that this is just a fraction of some of the penalties to be meted out on those that have participated in the destruction of property in learning institutions. He said this must be done in a bid to weed out bad characters from schools. The PS disclosed that the ministry is currently in possession of records of all the students who have masterminded arson attacks in secondary schools across the country. Now, the Council of Governors has decried a 398 million shillings reduction in the proposed recurrent expenditure budget selling for the next financial year by the Commission on Revenue Collection. With the next financial year expected to begin in June next year, just two months to the general election, the Council of Governors met to deliberate on the future of devolution pre- and post-election. The council accuses CRE of ignoring the uniqueness of different county governments as well as the fact that new administrations and MCS will meet in action after the next year's general election in August. A Form 3 student from Tara Secondary School in Marago constituency in Muranga County was allegedly murdered by a Boda Boda rider Monday. The suspect, who operates in Karaha area, is said to have lured the girl with a Christmas present and invited her to his home before killing her. It is reported that the rider had promised to buy her clothes for the festivities if she visited him at his home. The girl's body was moved to Muranga Hospital Mochari as investigations into the murder continue. Meanwhile, the suspect has since been arrested and is being detained at Muranga police station pending arraignment. Now, the Kenyan government has detained a controversial Danish flagged cargo ship in the port of Mombasa loaded with harmful nuclear waste alleged to have been meant for Tanzania coast. The ship, according to reports, carried the waste originating from Mumbai, India, sent for its destination in Dar es Salaam, Port Tanzania. It was detained after the Ministry of Health through C.S. Mutai Kagwe raised concerns ordering the ship to be quarantined awaiting load analyses. Kagwe further asked the Kenyan Nuclear Regulatory Authority to inspect the shipment to determine the radioactive material in question, the possible quantity and the position inside the ship. You are being advised to use water sparingly between today and tomorrow as Nairobi Water and Sewerage Company will be suspending water supply to allow for repair works at the Ngethu Water Treatment Plant. Areas in city center, UON main campus, Coca-Cola factory, JKIA, EPZ, Athi River and Mlolongo will be affected including several areas in the city. The shutdown will facilitate interconnection of the new Kiambu Embakasi pipeline to the Ngethu Gigiri transmission pipeline at the Kiambu Reservoir in readiness to transfer water to Embakasi, Mihango, Utawala and dry areas once the Northern Collector Water Project is completed in June 2022. Now, use of our 
outdated technologies and lack of cost-effective building solutions have been identified as factors hindering speedy construction of affordable houses, according to Kimoto Kimani, a real estate developer. The cost of construction in the real estate sector could be greatly reduced if players in the industry adopt the use of solutions such as aluminium foamwork that have been identified as affordable when compared to other materials. According to Kimani, the government has supported real estate developers of affordable housing units by ensuring horizontal infrastructure such as roads and sewer are available including for striking issuance of title deeds and giving rebates on value-added tax. Now, the delay in disbursement of 300,000 shillings and 250,000 shillings grants to FKF Premier League and National Super League clubs has been occasioned by the many procedures required before approval. This follows an undertaking by the government two weeks ago to provide 300,000 shillings and 250,000 shillings as logistical support to each of the 18 and 20 clubs competing in the top tier and second tier respectively. The amounts offered by the Ringera Committee to the Kenyan clubs are way below the 2 million shillings grant each of the teams had requested to enable prepare and honor league matches that resumed earlier this month after a three-week break. Speaking at Nyayo National Stadium in Nairobi, the committee said the leagues had resumed smoothly and thanked all stakeholders for their cooperation. This is Newswire, Dennis Aceto. The Spice FM Newswire is brought to you by Indriver. Download the InDriver app from the App Store or Google Play Store to enjoy a safe, comfortable, and affordable ride around Nairobi. 94.4 Spice FM. Nairobi. North Airport Road is where it's quite heavy right now. Rain continues in certain parts of the city. We're looking at traffic on uh, Mombasa Road. Imara Daima in and outbound. Uhuru Highway also. Um, still some traffic there. Lunga Lunga, Likoni, Jogo Road. And then out towards the interchange on Mombasa Road today. That continues. We're looking at Langata Road. Also still some traffic there. Uh, Rilo Dinga Way as you approach the roundabout to the city mortuary. Uh, that also is quite heavy now. And Uhuru Highway into the CBD is where you see the mishmash of traffic coming in from the thicker super highway just at the pangani underpass mothaiga square right there uh, is where there is a lot of traffic this morning juja road also still quite hot and have you bumper to bumper in many parts of juja road and also limuru road getting into the city let's take a look at westerns is it looking a little better now yes it is however you can still use the red hill link road out towards the city and back <laughs> let's see what it looks like in a short while spice fmke on twitter text 40127 This is The Situation Room, the home of hard-hitting political commentary and penetrating insights about the state of the nation. This is a talk radio experience like no other. The Situation Room, a place for hard truths, debates, and elevated conversations. The Situation Room, witty, political, engaging, deep, controversial. In the room, we have C.T. Muga, researcher, academic, seasoned political observer, a fountain of wisdom in these politically uncertain times. Ndu Oko, Nigerian by birth, Kenyan by choice, communications expert, pan-Africanist, a truth seeker and believer in people power, and Eric Latin. Agent provocateur, the man in the chair, seasoned journalist, news hound, a man who believes in punching up, not down. This Eight is after the nine. Situation Good Room. Good morning. The this only is Kenya's biggest conversation. It continues. Where are you tuned in this morning? Uh, wherever you are, let us know. We'll be glad to know where you are. City? Yes. Today's proverbs. Yes. Chanda Chema, Uvikwa Pete. Eh, eh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. But Chama Chanda gets the pet. Okay? Uh -huh. Yeah. Mkia Wanyani, how banduki nyani. Nyani ni wale wale. Uh -huh. <laughs> ni wale wale. No mkia ni ile ile. Mm -hmm. Mkia ni ule ule. An ape is an ape is an ape. Yes. <coughs> Remember, there was a story of uh, the student at Nairobi Technical who had received some money from 
her boyfriend, Mark de Mazel, from Belgium. Mm -hmm. And the ARA went to court and froze the account. Mm -hmm. And then a couple of days later, there was the story of another woman whose account was also frozen. Mm -hmm. Now, this second woman has uh, gone to court seeking the court to allow her to access her funds. Mm -hmm. Tebi Wambuko Kago says she is suffering due to the order and accused the asset recovery agency of rushing to court to freeze her bank account without giving her the chance to explain how she received the money from the Belgian businessman Mark de Bessel. This is the second case in less than a month by ARA. So she says, my right to privacy and dignity has been violated as the agency obtained my bank details without my knowledge, number one. They have subjected me to humiliation and suffering without giving me opportunity to explain and defend myself against the claims of money laundering. In her affidavit, she saw that she was not even aware that ARA was investigating her funds until she went to withdraw money from Equity Bank's branch at Garden City. And that's when she was told she couldn't access the money. According to her, she is not engaged in money laundering and that given the gravity of the claims, she deserves a chance to explain why and how she acquired the money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just thought you, it was important for you to know. Okay. Latest developments. On that. Mm. Okay. Mm. Scholars want Kiswahili spoken in public offices. Isn't it? Hold on. Uh. Scholars have called on state departments and agencies to incorporate the use of Kiswahili in offices. They say public institutions such as hospitals should embrace Kiswahili. Pwani University Vice Chancellor Mohamed Rajab said state officers should be compelled to offer services in a language popular among locals. He said many Kenyans seeking services in the judiciary and hospitals came out of those offices unsatisfied because they are not conversant with English. Professor Raja, who spoke during the 6th International Conference on Chama Cha Ukuzaji wa Kiswahili Duniani, held at the Pwani University grounds, said it was time Kenya promoted its own language. Kiswahili has been embraced internationally, but here in Kenya, we are not keen to promote it. If you want to transact business in foreign countries, they will ask you which language you want to use. And if you choose Kiswahili, a Chinese in Hong Kong will address you in it very fluently, he said. Kiswahili now. The conference brought together members of Kiswahili associations in Africa and was opened by Kilifi County Education and Technology Executive Rachel Musyoki on behalf of Governor Amazon Kingi. So, Kiswahili started in East Africa. The problem is that although it is a national and official language in some countries, our own perspectives are not conducive to promoting the language, particularly when writing our constitutions. Professor Mwaka, who teaches Kiswahili at Howard University in the U.S., said East Africans do not value what belongs to them, unlike other nations, such as China, which uses and promotes her own language. Often you will find that Kenyans praise things from foreign countries and vilify their own. That's how we have strayed. In education, we value foreign things at the expense of the local. Nancy Ngoa, doctor, the chairperson of the Department of Languages, Linguistics and Literature at Pwani University, urged Kenyan courts and parliament to use Kiswahili in their deliberations to enable the masses understand. She said, Kiswahili is an official language. Employers should ac accept job ac application letters in Kiswahili and in offices. Wait. You know, I'm listening to that story and wondering, Why? I thought Kiswahili is used in public offices. Officially? Yes. Mm -hmm. In parliament... Kiswahili is an official language. Mm -hmm. You can rise and speak in Swahili mm -hmm. and as a contribution in parliament. Now, what and in fact, say? they say, when you start in Swahili, don't mix. Mm. Speak in Swahili. Mm. Now, what They've even said mm. that laws shall also be published in Swahili. If you go to court, they'll speak Swahili. If you need translation services, you'll even get translation services mm. for Kiswahili. Mm. If you go to many... Uh, the public spaces, you'll find notices written in both languages, mm. English and Swahili. Mm. If you look at the notices that are required to be put on cigarette packages, right? Warning, cigarette smoking, excessive smoking, cigarette smoking causes blah, blah, this and the other. The requirement is that you shall also put it in Swahili. And it is in Swahili on cigarette packages. So what are we talking about? Our national language... Kiswahili is recognized even in law mm. as one of the 
national languages. These folks who are making these suggestions don't yeah. feel that it is emphasized enough and that they're saying it's an option as opposed to being front and center, that it is an option that you can use here and there, whether English and you know foreign matter takes the day. But they're saying that it should be insisted upon that Kiswahili be kind of like when you walk into or roam the streets of Dar es Salaam, for example, where everything is in Kiswahili and that you know that walking in, you hear that it's the Kiswahili that will be spoken. That's what they're saying, that folks should be compelled, judiciary, hospitals, parliament, that it should not be an option, that it should be the go-to, it should be the number one. That's what they're saying. That is a fight they're not going to win. <laughs> and are, are, you, are we saying that we say Kiswahili is the only official language in Kenya? That's what you should kick off with. And is not to... We have Kiswahili and or English. It should not be an option. It should be the one. That's what they're saying. Let me repeat. That is a fight they are not going to win. Mm. Why? The thing is this. Huh? Mm. Beyond making Swahili the national language, it is the national language. Mm. It is compulsory. It is taught. People speak Kiswahili. People speak Sheng people and other languages. Mm -hmm. Now, most Kenyans are trilingual. Mm -hmm. Most. They speak their mother tongue, they speak English, and they speak something that they call Kiswahili. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, so what are you saying? Are you saying that Swahili must dominate? How do you legislate this domination? How do you ensure, be beyond what has been done, I would like a picture painted for me mm. where Swahili is what they're saying it ought to be. That would just be changing that law and saying the national language in Kenya will be Kiswahili. It is already. And not saying Kiswahili and English. Because uh, I think now the, the beef that they're having here is the fact that you can walk into uh, any public office and choose to speak English mm. and you will be spoken to in English. And, I am and saying they're saying they want you to go to a public office and the person serving you Starts with Kiswahili. I, I thought that's what happened. They've gone ahead and what said. Happened, they've gone ahead and said huh? state officers should be compelled to offer services in a language popular among uh, locals. Compelled. Okay, that so that's not even Kiswahili, which is because vernacular. Which or is what? No, they're insisting on the Swahili now. So that is your f your go to must be Kiswahili. Don't start. Th there's no option of English. It can come later. You know, that is rolling back time. Mm -hmm. This world we live in is a global world. And when you think of opportunities as they exist in the human resource sphere, one of the things that stands out is one's capacity to be versatile in more than one language. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking about your mother tongue in Kiswahili. Mm -hmm. That just helps you here in Kenya and in Tanzania and Uganda. I'm talking about German, I'm talking about French, I'm talking about Italian, I'm talking about these languages that are recognized internationally. And part of the reason why Kenya is what it is, is that we have human resources that can compete internationally. That capacity is not necessarily embedded in the language of the English or in Kiswahili. There's something that scientists have proven beyond a shadow of doubt. One's mental capacity is actually enhanced by one's ability to juggle languages. People who have, the who have the capacity to speak more than one language, you may not think so, but their mental capacity is actually enhanced. Yeah. So what am I saying? Because the majority of Kenyans can actually speak three languages, it helps. Now, just look at the one component that is our major foreign exchange earner. What is it? Human resource. Hmm. Why do you think that human resource is what it is? Because we've internationalized ourselves. We are able to sell whatever we have internationally. That resource that we have, we are able to. The English language makes it very possible. Kiswahili is a wonderful language and must be enhanced. There's no doubt about it. Mm. But to put it the way they are saying it, that's rolling back time. To what end? What? National dignity? So our dignity is less because 
of this particular utopian sense that they're talking about is has not been achieved. Plus, I would like to see, I mean, if I'm going to even go scientific here, mm. I would like to see evidence of this thing that they're saying, that folks are inconvenienced going into public places and not being spoken to in a language that they prefer or understand. Have we seen that there's been a general lack of provision of these services because people are not comfortable, that people don't understand the judicial or legal process, mm. having gone to court and it's not spoken to them in language that they understand, or you go into the bank, or you go into the hospital be treated, and because they're not speaking to you in Kiswahili, then you are not getting I would like to see if there is, you know, commensurate information or data that supports this and say, okay, you know what, guys? A lot of people are at a disadvantage because they're not spoken because... to exactly. By the way, you uh, mentioned uh, hospitals and do. Uh, the language it? in hospitals is Kiswahili. Kiswahili. I know for uh, a fact that I go to hospital with myself, my children, and the, and the language is Kiswahili. Is Sometimes I have to say, okay, just help me a little bit here. Mm. But really, it is. It is Kiswahili. Immigration. It's the first question, whether they can see that you're not Kenyan or not. The first not. person the first interact first with is speaks Kiswahili. to you in Swahili. Yeah, so I really don't, I don't understand where this is, where the insistence is. And I really don't see that people are con inconvenienced or denied a service because they're spoken to in a language that they do not understand. Plus, I've also seen very many occasions where somebody may be spoken to in English and they say, Ongea Kiswahili. Yeah. <laughs> And it's spoke the Swahili is spoken to them. People switch to Swahili very quickly. Have we not had callers here who say, "Can I speak in Kiswahili?" Yes. And they say, "By all means, go ahead." Don't we ourselves speak in Kiswahili? Mm. Because people are comfortable enough to say what they would be more comfortable with as a mode of interaction. Do the reality of the way we speak as Kenyans, depending on who you are speaking to, one doesn't even think we mix languages all the time. Yes, yes. you do. Yeah. If we're conversationally. We always mix it. You'll throw in Shang, you'll throw in Kiswahili, you, you'll you throw in Delta State, mm. you, <laughs> you'll throw in Nigerian, <laughs> yeah? you'll even throw in French. Mm. Now, it's all in the quest for communication. Have you, haven't you found yourself sometimes talking to people who don't necessarily understand Kenyanese? Because mm. Kenyanese is that mixture. And you realize, oh, I'm speaking Kenyanese here. You have to take back. Yeah, so yeah. you've got to go back and yes. speak Swahili, Swahili Sanifu. Yes. Maybe that's what they're pushing for. Yes. Maybe. If they're saying, let's promote the proper Swahili, because what we have is a whole mishmash of things hmm. because we have not elevated Swahili as a language. Plus, I don't feel... I hmm. really, Look, I, I think that I, unconsciously, when you speak the language of your nativity, I think that automatically brings out a sense of pride and that you don't see that it is inferior. Because this is one of the things that they're complaining about here, that Kenyans have shunned Kiswahili and have to then shunned the things that are culturally native to them. Mm. And they're saying that, no, we're ready, Kenyans are too ready to embrace foreign cultures and foreign things. Why they vilify Swahili and the things that are native to Kenya? And I don't necessarily, I don't... I actually don't see that. If anything, I see the complete opposite. Yeah. I see the complete opposite in that. Let's hear from uh, our callers. John, good morning. Morning, how are you? Very well. Uh, I, I feel I think we are missing the point. Uh -huh. And uh, I think what they are saying is that uh, Swahili should be the first language of communication. Uh -huh. uh, I'll give you an example. If you go to court, they speak in English and they translate it in Swahili. In most cases, mm -hmm. while it's supposed to be the other way. Okay. Swahili, Swahili should be the first language, and those people who don't understand Kiswahili, then it's translated to English. So all courts should be Vyoja Mahakamani. Yes. Okay, John. Let's make if this conversation. To... Let's make this conversation Kiswahili. Now, start yes. again what you've just said and start in Kiswahili. Jambo ambalo na nasema ni kwamba Neno ambalo wanasitikiza ni kwamba wanataka kiswahili Kiswahili Liwe Diyo luga ambayo inatumika kila wakati Luga ya kwanza Ipewe kipa umbele Yes Luga ya kwanza ya mawasiliano Kwa mfano Nikupe mfano mungine Angalia na otisi zetu zote mahali. Mm. Inaandiko kwa kingereza, alafu inakuwa kitwahili. Mm. Lakini inafaa iwe kitwahili, alafu kingereza. Mm. 
ukitembea katika nchi yote waenda Ujerumani enda uh, Ufaransa wanaandika Kifaransa alafu wanabadilisha kizungu ama kibuga nyingine mm. lakini sisi tumebadilisha mm. so uh, basically that's what they are saying that we should give Kiswahili so the, start with Swahili so the president making yes. a national address mm. at uh, exactly. Jamhuri Day reads his speech in Kiswahili yes in fact that's the, the, the another example and then off the cuff in English Yes. All right. All 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 our all our all our our, 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 our uh, engagement uh, government engagement are in English. Mm. All of them official engagement are in English. We 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 tend to use you know there's this thing we have come up we say national language and then official language. Yes. Mm. So which is which is the national language? Swahili. Which is the official language? English. So it means if you are doing something official, you're speaking English. <laughs> mm, all those other things that you can use Swahili. It, yes, if you are doing something national, speaking Kiswahili. Uh, Why if, 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 if it is uh, in I other countries, good Ch- Chinese and all this, the, the, the official language is the national language. Tanzania the same, actually. You start with Swahili yes, and then yes. English is also used in, in Tanzania, but you start with Swahili. Start with Swahili. So we teach we, even our language of instruction should primarily be Swahili in school. Moja uh, tatu iwe nne. I think that is uh, going too far but <laughs> why it's happening ne- next door. It, it, it is it can still work it can still work but it will disadvantage you. Yeah. But oh, 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 generally the point is that Kiswahili should be the first language. Okay. It should not be the second language. Mm. Sawa. Thank you very much for your call. Thank you. 0719012600 Beatrice in Mombasa. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Jambo. Hatu Jambo. Jambo Beatrice. Hatu Jambo. Hatu ni wewe? Ah, tuna neno sisi ni mvua tu tele tele. Okay. Yes. Ai sifu ya mvua imemnyea. Ah, kwa mvua inenyesha. Aya. Uh, for me, Swahili should be first in this country. Mm. Moja, ni, let me use Swahili now. Mm. Ukiangalia politicians, ama president mwenye akitoa speech, mm. anatoa speech kizungu, alafu anarudi kiswahili. Kumin, kwetu bado kama inchi haija kubaliana kiswahili kuwa ni lugha inatakaniwa kuwa ya kwanza katika inchi hii. Mm-hmm. Kwa sababu nikienda kama niende Ulaya na ulizwa unatoka Kenya eh lugha yenu ya kwanza ni Kiswahili then Kizungu ni ya pili mm-hmm. so tunahesabiwa kuwa Kizungu kwetu ni ya pili si ya kwanza tukiwa nje tunahesabiwa sisi Kiswahili lugha yetu ya kwanza mm-hmm. so ikiwa sisi tunakubaliwa Kizungu Kiswahili ndio ya kwanza kwa nini kama nchi tusifanye Kiswahili kuwa ya kwanza mm-hmm. Okay. Vile vile mwenzangu anasema ukienda German uende France utakuta notice zimeandikwa na Kiswahili kwa Kijerumani kwa Kifaransa alafu sasa utakuta zinabadilishwa kwa kwa Kizungu. Hmm. So inakuwa rahisi okay. watu kuelewa. Beatrice unajua tofauti iliyopo ni hivi. Naam. Nchi hizi ambazo unataja hmm. nchi nzima lugha ambayo inaunga hao watu ni lugha moja. Naam. Sisi Mm. tuna lugha nyingi lakini tuko na moja ya taifa za wamama za 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 mama ndio hivyo ndio hivyo so uh-huh. nilikuwa natafautisha tu kidogo ili eleweke kwamba mm. kuwa na lugha ambayo mnajua ni yenu ni kitu kizuri mm. sana walakini kuna mambo mengine ambayo mm. lazima pia tuyatilie manani si ni kweli naam mm. Hao pia walipoteza Naam. lugha nao lugha zao za zamani. Mm-hmm. Wali pia wao walipoteza, walipoteza lakini ile communication tuseme kile ile mtu aweze kuelewa. Sidhani hata ule mtu uko shambani. Mm. Maana nakumbuka mimi nyanya yangu akiwa hai na nikifika nyumbani kwetu mashambani lilikuwa ile lugha ya mama mimi sielewi sana mm. lakini nikizungumza naye Kiswahili iwanielewa alafu yeye ananijibu na ile yake ya mama. <laughs> Kumini iwanielewa. Yeah. Alafu sasa ukiangalia wanasiasa wanapoenda katika mikutano yao na na gathering zao wanazungumza kizungu kule mwananchi yuko pale chini haelewi lolote 
kwa political rally wanatumia Kiswahili. Ah, pa, eh, political rally wanatumia kizungu Kiswahili, kwa sababu Ah ah, wajua kwa nini wanazunguza kizungu? Si wako wako coast hii hii weekend sio? Eh eh, wanazunguza Kiswahili. Hata wakienda. Wakienda kiz, kiz, wakienda mali pengine bado wanataka kuzunguza kizungu. <laughs> All right Beatrice let me pick other colors. Na unajua kizungu kwa nini wanataka kuzunguza kizungu? Kwa sababu nyinyi media ndio muweze ku capture whatever. Ku mean kwa nyinyi media hamuelewe Kiswahili. Ah. Beatrice. Salim in Malindi good morning. Morning. How are you? Morning. Nzuri na ntongea kwa Kiingereza kwa haraka haraka. Ah yeah. Just something to ponder on. Especially after Latif you just mentioned Tanzania. Yes. From what I hear, you may probably need to confirm this. In 1966, there's a clamor by the MPs in mm. Tanzania for deliberations in parliament to be done in Swahili. Nyerere himself said that should never be. He said if we do that in Kiswahili, those deliberations will never end. <laughs> I just thought I'd mention it. <laughs> Thank you, Salim. <laughs> and another thing, speaking of languages, and this is something that I'm really shocked about, and again, in English. Mm. You know, when you say severally, severally, mm. I've even heard mm. a lot of lawyers, high-powered lawyers saying severally. I think what we need to confirm with that is when you say severally, it is in the legal sort of sense, when you say jointly and severally, when you've spoken mm. to a person individually mm. and then as a group severally so mm. when you say many times you don't say severally you say several, several times, times. Mm. severally i'd have to cut you up into pieces <laughs> in order to deal with you severally you know as in english they say <laughs> you sever something to <laughs> cut you off from someone you know some of some people are murdering the english language aside now can you imagine even with the quality of swahili that nationally we speak I think you know we need to get real on this one. Asante. Thank you Salim. Salim asante sana. <laughs> Irongo. Yes, good morning. Good, good morning. morning. Um I I I think uh, what what the those arguing that we should start from Kiswahili and then the other way around are doing is that they are actually of stretching their argument. Uh-huh. First of all, it's not true that Kiswahili is not spoken Kiswahili is, is spoken in the hospitals and every other place in fact wherever you go for services most of the time you are addressed in Kiswahili and nobody will ask will compel you to speak in English oh. so it tells me then that uh, whatever they are, the argument they are pushing forward is an academic argument um Kiswahili as it were is a national language yes but not as national as probably Germany would be in the country called Germany. We have communities in Kenya here where you will find that uh, the, 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 the locals will struggle to understand what you are telling them if you address them in Kiswahili. And finally, go to the, go to the Lego practicing now. Nina hakika kwamba kuna vipengele fulani ambavyo hata wanasheria wenyewe watavipata vikiwa vigumu sana kuvijadili katika lugha ya Kiswahili. Ina, itakuwa ni vigumu sana kuleta vipengele fulani ili vieleweke katika lugha ya Kiswahili. It's therefore uh, oh, I will explain. You see uh. Kiswahili was uh, made mandatory in around 1984 when we brought KCPE otherwise it was not tested there before mm-hmm. even if it was taught in school the fact that it was not tested meant not a lot of effort was put in it mm-hmm. in fact it was an optional subject see, yeah it was optional yes I, I, I remember i would see i could see my sister in secondary then who only met Kiswahili now in terms of Farsi, and the way they were writing the Farsi, it was in a very horrible uh, sarouf because they had not known the grammar that goes around Kiswahili. Mm. Most of the lawyers who are now aging that we have, 
cannot converse in very fluent Kiswahili, which I'm sure the proponents of this argument are talking about. Uh -huh. So in Tanzania, they have made a lot of effort. In fact, in the, almost all the fields, and particularly in the law, hmm. where they can go to court, and you will hear them arguing this, uh, making their arguments in Kiswahili, regardless of what they're talking about. But yeah. here, it is at all order. You will see the magic. You know, I think, back I think you've just made English. a case for the proponents of this. Mm, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> because what they're saying yeah, yeah. is let's go back yeah, yeah. and start it from school, mm. make it a national yeah, yeah. language, make it the first language, so that future generations will not yes. have the challenges mm. that the old folk are having now. Like you've said, there are lawyers today who will have issued the Kipenge, but go to Tanzania, they don't. If they are talking about us going to do it at school, I have no problem with that. But if they are saying that, let us, if we go to court now, let us start from Kiswahili, I have a problem with that. It has to grow. It has to grow. We have okay. a long way to go. By the way, the Kiswahili that is spoken in Kenya here, in the villages and in the streets, is not Kiswahili. But some Sheng and some other languages brought together to form some scam. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Molimu. <laughs> thank you, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Zero seven one nine zero one two six hundred. There's some professors who basically have said, look, we need to promote Swahili and make it what? A V the language. The first option. In uh, all public offices. Mm. That you go to any public office and your first language is Swahili. And the language that you shall receive your services with is Swahili. Okay. So the pros and cons of these are what are we are discussing now. 0719-012600. Let's take a break. We'll pick your calls shortly. Good morning. This is the Situation Room. The only way to start your day. Spice up your life. If I'm found guilty, there is no problem I'm willing to serve. Mm. I have no problem. Jails are meant for human beings. They say a society gets the leadership it deserves. Mm. If you have a corrupt, crooked and rotten society like we have in Kenya, then of course they will get that kind of a leadership. I think the president should dissolve parliament. That's the best solution at this moment in time. Dissolve parliament. All of you go home. Yes, we all go home. How are we encouraging other people who might have new and creative ideas Young people who are making money without any government help. They are just buying their own bundles. They are going on TikTok and making money. KRA is coming after them. Mm. I've been in parliament for 15 years. We have been unable to pass the gender law. And yet no presidential candidate is talking about it now. Because we are fake. The truth is all the men refuse to vote for that law. What did Sonko do to Pomoni from Maternity Hospital? Yeah, he with cleaned his it own up. money. Cleaned it with his own, own money. money. That, that was him as an individual. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I do not think it's coming down in a drizzle the in Nairobi weather at 18 highs of 22 and lows of 16. It's raining in Nakuru at 20 highs of 24 and lows of 15. We'll see 16 as the low in Yeri where it's also raining at 18. Mostly cloudy conditions at 19 in Eldor at highs of 23 and lows of 14 today. Mombasa is cloudy at 28, highs of 30 and lows of 25. And in Malindi, it's raining at 29 with highs of 31. We'll see lows of 25. Mostly cloudy conditions at 25 in Kisumu, highs of 29 and lows of 19. While in Kakamega, it's mostly cloudy at 25, highs of 30 and lows of 17. Partly sunny conditions in Kampala at 24 with highs of 26. And Dar es Salaam is still wet this morning at 29, highs of 31 and lows of 26. Still a cloudy, hazy morning in Lagos at 23, highs of 34 and 17. And cloudy in Johannesburg, highs of 22 and lows of 14. At 25, it's sunny in Kinshasa, highs of 33 and lows of 24. Out in Beijing, dipping into early evening at 7, it's sunny. That'll be the high going to lows of minus 2. Paris is bang on zero, highs of 4 and lows of minus 2. While cloudy conditions herald London's morning at 5, highs of 7 and lows of 5. And it's clear in New York at 3, coming into very early Tuesday morning. We'll see highs of 7 and lows of 3. Welcome.
Welcome to Spice FM, the best exclusive radio station. It continues in most parts of the city. This is all before General Motors on Mombasa Road this morning. That's moving very slowly. And we're also seeing that heavy traffic on the Southern Bypass. From the Likoni Interchange going out into the city, Langata Road also piling up quite some, as is uh, Lusaka and that whole exchange going out towards the city. Huru Highway continues to be a thing as we go into the city. Pangani then, as you're going into the CBD as well, quite tight, right? So traffic hour is officially over, but we have, because of the rains, unfortunately, some tight traffic this morning. Let's keep an eye on things through the day. Help us out with that. Spice of MKE on Twitter, text 40127. Okay, so we continue talking about and reminding you about Showmax. www.showmax.com is the website. Log on and find out how you subscribe to Showmax on any day of the week that you want to. Get access to all premium entertainment, children's programming, what else? Documentaries and live sports. Uh -huh. Series. Uh -huh. uh, there's something I've forgotten. Movies. Movies. Uh -huh. So much more. Yes. All this available on Showmax. Mm. And you just get access to Showmax on five devices that you can log on uh, to Showmax. And you can actually be streaming on sh two different devices at the same time. So one person is one is here watching their favorite show and the other person is there watching their favorite show on the same account, We're different devices. Everybody is happy at the same time. Don't you have to be at... Yes. You get the device. Yes. You get the device. Yes www.showmax.com Go find out more information. Spice up your life. Mature, intelligent talk every morning. Spice up yourself. Done right. 94. News 0719012600. Swahili is the national language as the first language in every uh, government office. What really are we talking about here? Are we talking about national identity? Are we talking about national pride? Are we talking about a distinct uh, not just national identity, but a, a, a distinct mode of communication that sets us apart from other people. Who, who, what exactly are we talking about? And if we are talking those about those three, this, put them together. It's a combination of all of Fine. those factors. So, are we saying that our identity is diminished? Yes. As we now speak, these these individuals who've come up with these suggestions are saying just that: that you elevate uh, foreign nationality and ways and practices and vilify your own. Do we really vilify? It? We're not giving it as much prominence as we should. Mm. Okay? This is why you find that our president will go and address the United Nations General Assembly in English. Mm. And the next speaker who stands up to speak is the president of China, stands and speaks in, in Chinese. Yeah. And he knows, well, it's in Chinese, mm. in <laughs> Mandarin, and he knows English. The leader of Germany will speak in German. She knows, or oh, the previous one, the current one also, knows English, can speak, but they choose German. How do we promote our national languages? How do we go and say, I come from this region, part of the world, that has over 100 million people who speak this one language called Swahili, and I am speaking Swahili. I speak Swahili, let the people in the booth translate you to your ear it out. what I'm saying. You figure it out, is what they're saying. Yes. Let it be the option. Let it be the first port of call. All these other things that you normally do, let them come second. You figure it out. If it's not on your list, if it's in that drop-down list, and Swahili, put it there. Put it there. Let, it be, let them okay. figure it out. And that yeah. changes what exactly? Gives us more identity and pride. Mm. Really? How yes. is it manifested? And how, oh, how my do you see that? One of the things I'll that you're talking you. about when you're lifting up your, your own national, your language that mm. you speak, that thing of your nativity that you hold dear to you, mm. once they hear you are speaking in it first, mm. so many other things come along. You've put yourself, you've put it up there 
as one of the first things that you open your mouth and that's one of okay. the first things that comes up. Fine. Now, and you've done it, and then how does it now benefit on you? On a regular directly? basis. No, there's a sense of pride. There's a sense of pride that comes. What, how does pride benefit you? That's directly? what I'm going to ask. How, how exactly is this pride going to help you? Pride in identity is a big thing. Identity, I get. Pride, I'm asking. I'm just wondering, how does it help you on a day-to-day -day basis? Let's ask Zachary. Zachary. Oh, good morning. <laughs> good morning. Uh, how are you? We're fine, fine thank, thank you. Thank you. Oh, Mia, Mata, uh -oh. Oh, hey, Zachary, what have you done? Oh, oh my God. I don't know what I... Why? I don't know. I don't, but I went uh, to the hospital yesterday. Mm. Mm was tested and I was told, oh, you look a bit okay, but we are going to do this and this and this. Mm. So I'm actually having a pack of uh, tablets here and I was also injected. And, uh, well, I, 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 I'm just praying that I'm going to get well. It know, isn't COVID, Zachary, is it? I am coughing, Maureen. I am Only. also having some bit of, uh, you know, tasteless, tastelessness. Mm. But um, I thank God. I thank God that uh, you, my my bogey is there. And, uh, you know, you are that you. You are my bogey. And yeah, bogey is taking care of you. Did they test for COVID? The bogey is, uh, yeah. <laughs> so let me say this: mm. that I'm wishing you uh, all of you a merry Christmas and a happy New Year. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, we 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 just tell God, oh, even if you don't have money, you know, you give us peace and you give us a good help. Mm. Now, to the issue of Kiswahili and uh, English, uh, I, I know many of you have gone into offices or to, you know, banking services and whatever. When you speak in Kiswahili, it doesn't matter how Sanifu it is. Mm. Here in Kenya, I mean here in Kenya, mm. you are looked upon as a second hand rate uh, citizen or, you know, people person. <laughs> really? And, yeah, yeah, yeah. They take you, you are uneducated, you are an, not civilized, you are not having the British manners, and uh, you are you are likely to get some low services, yeah. Mm. So uh, I would advise uh, the, the the ones who are in school, uh, even if you take care of your Kiswahili, unless 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 now our attitude changes, mm. yeah. Mm. Take care of the English very much. Like me, when I go out to do my negotiations for this, I speak. Well, English of the nose, Maureen, up to there we are. <laughs> 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 it's like it's to the nose. If you go to and you kind of uh, interact with the, the police people, yeah? <laughs> when you like now try to, if they ask you in general, speak English of the nose, and they will hear you, they will actually try to. The speak. police will let you go. No, or even if they are not going to let you go, mm. They actually give you some bit of respect, yeah. <laughs> but they end up with that. You said that you maybe like to ask you that. Now you talk, ah, they 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 love us. You say, yeah. So in Kenya, in Kenya, they uh, they kind of insist that you speak. Even to the specific is that we you know run around sometimes. If you speak to them in English, English of the nose. Uh, ah, you stand a chance. You, 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 you stand they're, they're the chance of spending your money. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You listen there. <laughs> you know, and let me say this, yeah. Mm -hmm. I've got a feeling that uh, probably in 50 years to come, yeah, some some, some people from Mount Kenya will say, oh, let us also make uh, Kikuyu a national language because in every part that I have gone in this country, yeah, mm. you will find that, okay, this is a Mijikeda, he, he or he speaks a bit of Kikuyu. Mm -hmm. You go through Nyanza. Some guys there speak good Kikuyu than us, yeah? Mm -hmm. So, and given that the Kikuyu is the, the largest ethnic uh, group in, in Kenya, mm -hmm. I'm seeing that kind of conversation starting, actually. Okay. That's, that's my kind of, that's my kick, yeah? Thank you, Zachary. We wish you all the best, man. But, Oh, thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Ugua Pauline. Ugua Get well soon. Uh, yeah, Santi. Okay, Santi. Okay. 0719 Charlie Mealy says, most politicians talk in English. I always also wonder whether most of the recipients understand. Which politicians are these? They speak in English when they go for Nita rallies. Nita Weka, 100 billion. No, politicians yeah, speak in Swahili. Yeah, they speak in Swahili. Yeah, mama wamboga. Na yule muungwana mwingine anafanya...
Though that's not English. I mean, it's a party a shilling shilling elf sita. Sasa. Kwa kila mwananchi. Is that English? Elf sita. Is that is that English? <laughs> Some could also ask is that Kiswahili? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Meaning, no mistaking it. You know exactly what was being spoken of. Yeah. Aloof. Or don't you know? Alof Sita. What? What? Who doesn't know what Alof Sita is? Na muungwa na na mutoa vitenda vili na whatever. Who doesn't understand that city? Let's come back to what you were saying earlier. All right. Mm. The issue. That issue of identity, pride, and all. Yes. All right. Okay. okay. So, what, then, what's, what's your case? Are you saying that that when 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 people speak in that when you're in a congregation a group of people and you start mm. speaking your language the closest language to you let's say you're in a group of people and then you start speaking your mother tongue mm. or you're in a group of uh, people from a certain national certain country and you're speaking swahili don't you feel that pride of course so what you is, do what is even strange eh. is how if you've traveled you are in a mall somewhere somebody walks up to you and greets you in kiswahili yes and you ask in Kiswahili what made you greet me uh, umejuaje mm-hmm. so you ask so, so you get chatting you will eventually talk in english. english english but the point of contact that makes the conversation and the easy, goodbyes will be in swahili yes and also <laughs> you when you speak to someone in Kiswahili you identify yourself as being one of them it's very mm-hmm. true let me tell you a story please I, when i travel i on one of my travels back home and we stopped in please understand when i say remote hmm? mm. we stopped in a small town in nasarawa state oh. which is not too far from abuja okay. right how many states are there in nigeria 36 <laughs> okay <sighs> now we got into a small cafe and there were two gentlemen speaking kiswahili now i am not kenyan but cafe. i Yes, a What, small you know in Kenya they are called hotels but mm. then gone. The hotel in Dogo in in Auza Maragwe na Namandazi. Namandazi. So I am not Kenyan but I went to them and I said something to them in Swahili and you should have seen the, the look excitement. on their faces. They were it was like that's the pride that we were talking about. They were beaming like they the were sun animated. itself. They were so happy asking me ah, and then I had to tell them okay slow down. I'm not Kenyan however I live there, you know? And so now you could see it. because you identify with that language and that you speak it with them and here they were having a conversation amongst themselves just the two of them nobody else what i mean the, what are those kenyans doing in that small corner they, of they were working in, on, on a project mm. interestingly enough kenyans. there's an ngo right they're working on a project there mm. but they were having a conversation just the two of them nobody else understood this language until somebody else walked in and then you could see oh my goodness elevated to another place and they must have been on a high for the we rest of many. the day that, How is it that here in the middle of nowhere literally that you find somebody else then apart from the two of us who've been sent here and they can you so that's the, what I'm, that sense see, of pride. the point you're making yeah uh, Swahili hasn't been elevated mm. to the point that is being suggested I am not downgrading what is being said mm. I'm simply saying that people know Kiswahili it's not just with fellow Kenyans mm. You travel abroad and you come across somebody who tells you the Tanzanian. What you'll find you immediately is a talking Kiswahili that person. Mm. Even if your Kiswahili is completely fractured. Yes. Mm-hmm. You start talking in Kiswahili. So it's I'm true. saying it's not that people don't understand or don't value the identity or the importance that Kiswahili plays. My argument is the emphasis they speak of I understand. But I'm talking about a balance. Mm. We live in a time and an age where not a language languages are important yes. not just a language yes mm. and they play a very very key role yes. but when it comes to your identity even here in Kenya all right I have been abroad and I find people speaking a language that's not Kiswahili and I know it's a Kenyan language yeah. I immediately head in their direction and start talking to them mm. Mm. Because it's identification. Yes, place. I know the language. I may not speak it, but I know. But you know, this, this is a Kenyan this, this language. This is a Kenyan language. I know it's mm. a Kenyan language. Mm. So language and its role is something you can't actually divorce from people. How do you balance it? So the thing, city, I guess, is elevating. The same way we're talking about international languages. Yes. Okay. Mm. The language 
the native speakers of Swahili, that's the argument that they have, are more than nat native speakers of some of these other so-called international languages. Yes. So let's elevate Swahili and give it its prime of place in, in international languages and uh, say... Let's Swahili, make a deliberate let's effort. Let's make a deliberate effort and say, yes. don't just look at us and say, oh, you, third party, that third country people who speak mm. some funny language. No. Yeah, speak one of ours. Swahili yeah. is actually a big international language. Meaning, when you come and to And the only country, way it's going to be promoted. Mm -hmm. This person teaches Swahili, is a professor of Swahili in a uni U.S. university. Mm. Howard, yeah. The only way we are going to elevate Swahili such that now it becomes one of those things that people are choosing as subject choices in international schools outside of Africa as, you know, I want to study Swahili. It's the same way we see children in Kenya choosing I want to study Spanish, mm. French, German because it's known that this is one of the international languages that you need. Do you know what is actually strange, Eric? Mm. What you're saying already happens. Mm -hmm. People at least study. You come across, I have come across people who speak such idiomatic Swahili and they are not natives of this continent. Yep. Meaning they studied it. We have sat yes. here with one, a Japanese. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Dr. One, Dr. Dr. Mid Midori San. Yes. Yes. She has went and studied Swahili. But you see, she went and studied Swahili at a certain level, yes. right? At, as a choice. Just the same way people are studying Chinese at the Confucius Institute here. Mm. But promote it and make it such a big thing that in school, when you say now you're studying in an international language, one of the choices shall be Swahili. Swahili. You know, you know, Zachary actually hit a proverbial nail on his proverbial head. Eh? Mm. Mm. Because you, when we have visitors from the West coming in and trying to speak the language with us, Habari Yako, you cut them short immediately. Hey, like, ah, come Nani, on, let's get to the point. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> English of the oh, it's okay. Yeah. I speak English. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Let's, just, Let's just converse in yeah. English. Yeah. I mean, so you're, you're, you're clearly laboring it. Mm. Yes. And yet, when you go to certain European countries, you're going to have to learn their language. Mm. Uh, They'll insist. They won't. You no, are going to they won't insist. They just will speak to you in their own language. language. Yep. They may if know they the language you also know. They they know the language but you they're know. Not speaking to but you. they will not speak to you in yours. Yes. They will speak in their own. You catch up or... Sorry. I don't know the So direction. essentially what we're saying is yeah. you come to a country, you're going to speak to us in Swahili. Yes. That's it. Swahili is the language. You land at the airport, you're filling those forms in Swahili. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's getting in at that rate. <laughs> it, that's the first one. And mm. then there's a translation. Mm. In brackets. So it's Swahili and then, then in brackets, brackets in English. In English. Yes, yes. Swahili in brackets in English. Mm -hmm. You know. They do have a point. I'm also beginning to see that. I see it too. They do have a point. I see it too. I'm also beginning to see mm. it. They, 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 they actually do have a point. Yes. And if you look at just how widespread the speaking of Eskin Swahili in East and Central Africa, mm. many people speak that language. Yeah. But even if you look at Lingala in uh, DR Congo and the other Congo, it's Swahili. if you look at a mix of Swahili, the local native tongue, and, and French. Some French. Yes, Bana Kenya. Mm. Bana Sema. Mm. <laughs> it's odd though, isn't it? Yeah. The unifying factor of a language cannot be understated. Yes. Oddly enough. I remember one young man when we were in the university. You are first years, eh? Mm. And somebody I knew. So, this guy had studied in the rural areas all his life mm. in Luoland. We'd been in the, the university for a month. Mm. So one day he calls me aside and tells me, Muga, this place is very good. But there are very many foreigners here. <laughs> <laughs> foreigners? If you've grown up in an area and all the people you interact with, the majority, speak your language and they're your people. Yes. But the rest of you all are foreigners. You come That's into sure. a university that has all Kenyans. <laughs> it's a very strange place <laughs> for you. <laughs> Because there aren't enough people to speak the language that you're familiar with. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it was an eye-opener. I asked him, the foreigners, in, in, in Luo, it's very interesting. Mm. It's, it's called Mwache. Mm. It says, these foreigners, these, these, I don't these know about the foreigners, they're Kenyans. It says, yeah, but they're foreigners. They, they, yeah. Don't, they, you know, they don't speak our language. They're not ours. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good point, though. Let's conclude with the day's proverbs. Right. There are two. Chanda Chema, 
uvikwa pete mm. mkia wa nyani hao banduki nyani now this saying is actually quite simple okay one i'll simply say you get what you deserve or you could argue you get what you worked for mm. and you are what you are You are what you are. Yes, you are what you are. Mm. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much for tuning in to Kenya's biggest conversation, The Situation Room. We'll be back tomorrow morning, God willing, 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. And um, we want to, again, ask Zachary, get well soon. Anybody else who's feeling unwell at this time, yeah. get well soon. Yolanda and DJ Absolute will be here from 11 and that uh, will be playing for you Sugar and Spice. Edward Quach will be here from 3 to 7 on Spice Drive, taking you home with some lovely music and some lovely conversations. And then the adults in the room. And who are the adults? Arnold, Barbara and Carigo will be here from 7 p.m. Taking you until 10 p.m. Have a lovely day, folks. It's now 10 a.m.